taking control Shoveling dirt in every hole Predators to condemn your soul Watching you and watching me We're all connected but separated Misunderstood and so frustrated A million armies of one have invaded Watching you and watching me Who is it behind glass curtains That act like nothing's wrong Soon you will be To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies Little brother Standing by to dethrone each other Watching you and watching me Paranoid, the lens is our weapon Desensitized in our lust for attention Democratized by our boyer obsessions Watching you and watching me Slave to perfection Don't let them project you as you are
let your experience begin right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and thank you so much for listening in at SpacedOutRadio.com and on Spreaker. As once again, we come in from the frozen Canadian tundra, battle our way past the wild animals, sidestep Bigfoot, and enter Uncle Jimbo's cabin, stoke the fire, heat this place up, and broadcast you live on this Wednesday night, early Thursday morning, if you're on the East Coast. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we do this thing seven days a week. We want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the spiritual, supernatural, conspiratorial, ufological, and so much more. Like our music? We do too. If you head to the Spaced Out Radio website, you will hear the guitar god himself, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses. He is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Click on his Bumblefoot banner on our website. You can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, we say hello to everyone listening in on the High Plains Talk Radio Network, in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, along with our fans on Facebook at Euphoria Chronicles, Chronicles of the Unknown, Forest Moon Paranormal, and our flagship chat room, the S-O-R Space Travelers. Hey, Space Travelers, for only five bucks a month, you can now join the S-O-R Space Travelers Club. That's less than a Starbucks coffee. We will be doing monthly prize draws, the first one this Friday, just two days away. We will also give you a special section to our website and so much more. We're going to give you a hell of a lot more than just access to our archives. While on our website, you can also check out who we associate with and read the SOR Space Travelers Space Wire. Spaced Out Radio's news director, Eric Markham, has posted some great stories from around the world. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or at a distance. Purpleplates.com, helping heal your body, mind, and soul. The new Agora newspaper is the official paper of this show. And the iTunes app, Spirit Story Box. It's the official ghost hunting app of SOR. From UFC fights and celebrity sightings to the wine, women, and song that rules Sin City, Las Vegas is one of those towns that can make you or break you. For most part, the house always wins. But every now and again, the bright lights allow someone to arise from the gambling mecca ashes. John Huntington, bets known for his heart in Huntington tattoo shops back in the day, is an entrepreneur extraordinaire. He literally lived the life every single guy between the ages of 21 and 40 wanted to live. Fast life, money, status, hot women everywhere, fast cars, you name it, well, he had it. John is an accomplished businessman with ideas running fast and 
and furious through his brain. From his DJing in the hottest clubs to making sure his new life takes off, John is a power thinker. Behind the party scene back in the day was a man of conviction and of esoteric thought, but it wasn't enough. What possesses a guy who has it all to give it all away? What goes through a person's mind when he finds out that material things don't really matter? It was like a cleansing of John's soul that needed healing. So one day, five years ago, a decision was made. John Huntington walked away from it all. Not many people know why. Everyone has wanted this story. But John was done with the media and the spotlight until tonight. We welcome in to Spaced Out Radio Now, John Huntington. John, how are you? John, can you hear us? Because we are broadcasting live. I hear you. All right. We are going to try and hook up with John here once again. Give me just a couple of seconds here. The one thing that I was excited about having John a part of this show is because he hasn't told his story. He just walked away. And when you walk away from everything, you really, really want to be able to make sure that you know what you're doing, that you've made the right decision, that you've made the right call. And sometimes that call is about needing to find a new place in life. So that's what he did. And when you do something like that, you have to be able to be ready for the ultimatum. And the ultimatum is the answer to yourself. Now, we're going to get John on here momentarily because at the most inopportune time, Skype has decided to kind of go a little haywire with us. So we're going to get that back happening right here. It's an interesting story. I've known John for a couple of years. And I've said, hey, dude, I need you on my radio show. And he was like, no. I'm not doing the media anymore, man. I'm done. All right, John, we got you here. How are you doing? Hey, what's up, buddy? How are you? I am good, man. You know, we had a little bit of a Skype issue there, so we are back running here, and we are doing very well. It's good to have you with us, my friend. Thanks, man. They can put a man on the moon, but they can't make a computer work, huh? Well, you know what? Sometimes I don't really understand this whole Skype thing and why it acts up, but you know what? It happens, and I'm good to have you with us, man, because... Thanks, man. I haven't, I haven't seen you since Vegas with that, with that hot-ass cousin of yours. Where you been? Oh, geez. I'm not even going there. <laughs> not even going there. She's trouble. That's all I'm saying, man. She all is trouble. trouble. We're all trouble. Well, you know what? The one thing that I'm happy about, man, is that you decided to choose us to tell your story and to be a part of breaking it open, telling us what you're all about. So, John, one of the things that I want to get into with you tonight is, and we're going to get into it in a lot in hour number two, is you had it all, man. Like like I read in the intro, you had the life that everyone between the ages of 21 and 40, if you're a man, wanted to have. You had fame, you had money, you had women, you had fast cars, you had successful businesses, yet you decided to walk away from it all. Why did you do that, man? Yeah, man, it, yeah. You know, it all comes down to that my parents raised me a certain way, and my dad pushed me into my first wave when I was five years old, and I'm, I'm just a barefoot surfer at heart, man, and and uh, all that other stuff that blew up, and, and, and it went real well, and, and it was great for a minute, but uh, it, it started to stress me out too much, and I just realized that it really wasn't the life for me, and I just wanted to return back to my chill Buddhist beach life, and uh, kind of give it all up, and sell it all, and take it, take off, and kind of go back to my roots, um, I got real sick and got put in the hospital, and I literally almost died. I mean, I was in the hospital for three and a half months because of stress. And and when that all happened, it kind of came down to, you know what? Uh, my doctor said basically, you're going to die, or you're going to, or, or you're going to quit this business and and go back to your old lifestyle and live. And it was pretty heavy. It was a heavy thing. So I I pretty much checked out of the hospital when they told me that, and I friggin' packed my board bags and took off for Thailand alone to basically go die. And uh, I happened to step into a, a, a Buddhist temple and uh, did 30 days of silence with those guys, and next thing you know, I'm alive. I was healthy, and I was walking out of there, and I mean, that's the Kryptos version of it, but 
pretty much it came down to that. It was just it was just too much, man, for too long, and we were just pinning it and burning the the candle at both ends, and uh, you know, with the TV show and all the time, I mean, nine tattoo shops and running clubs and doing all that stuff. I was literally on a plane every other day, plus touring as a DJ. It was just it was just too much, bro. And, you know, a lot of people say, I got the gas in the tank in order to do that. I have the fire, I got the vig, the vitriol, whatever you want to call it. But they don't understand what a toll it actually takes on your body. And you needed to figure out a way to self-preserve. Otherwise, you were you were going to be six feet under. Well, I mean, that's the truth. And, and believe me, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 50 years old and I train three hours a day every day. I'm probably one of the fittest people or the 50, fittest 50 year olds you've ever met for damn sure. And, you know, I was an athlete my whole life, and I don't care how strong and how tough you think you are. I mean, the things that you face, once you get money, the hardest thing about it is keeping it because everybody wants it. And that means the government, that means, I mean, everybody came after me. I was in lawsuits up to my ears, um, always fighting somebody. I mean, I was paying off people that were going backstage, falling off my go go stages, and, and it was my fault. I was paying. Everybody was coming after me, man. Once you become the target, you become the target, and and everybody wants what you got. You know what I mean? So, to me, I, I would rather just be broke and in flip flops, living on the beach. You know, right here in beautiful Kona, where I'm standing right now, having a beer at Bongo Bands, and just uh, this is the restaurant I run here in Kona, Hawaii, and kind of chill here and and uh, do my thing. And you know, the stress is gone, and, I, and my my owners still take good care of me, Paul and Manny, and. And then I'm living the life. I surf every day. I work out every day. I come to work. I have a team of 55 great employees, and uh, life is perfect, Rock. And you know what? That's good to hear, man, because for so long, when you decided to disappear, you literally went right off the map. Oh, no, no. I walked into, I walked into LAX, and this is no joke. I had a cell phone with 5,800 contacts in it. I was averaging 2,000 texts a day. And I mean everybody from Steve Wynn's cell phone to, I mean, everybody you can imagine, every high roller. When I walked into LAX, I literally threw my, my uh, phone into the trash can, boarded a plane to Thailand alone, not knowing one person, and flew. When I landed in Bangkok, I was so sick, I had to actually, I was throwing up in the airport, I had to get into, a, I, I got into a taxi, got to a, to a hotel, and there it took me five days to get enough strength of sleep, five days of sleeping and eating to get enough strength to go on another hour and little contact flight to Koh Tao, Thailand. And uh, I landed there, and I immediately went into a Buddhist temple and went into 30 days of silence. So I basically literally vanished. Okay, went in, buzzed my head, uh, got rid of anything that was, was monetary, anything that was that, and, uh, and basically did my own thing, man, you know? Did your family know that you were going to go to this extreme, or did you startle everyone by just walking away and just, like, basically leaving the planet for about a month? All uh, right. Oh, yeah, no, my mom and dad uh, were the ones that dropped me off at the airport and left me uh, left me in tears. They pretty much thought I was going to die. It was, it was gnarly. It was so gnarly. So, yeah, it was, it was a hard thing to do, but it was something I had to do for myself, and, and I did it. And now I'm back, and I'm stronger than he- ever, healthier than ever. I mean, I'm, I'm 6'4", 210 right now, walking at probably 10% body fat, and just killing, having a good time. That's good to hear, man, because really it is about self-preservation and what you can do to take care of yourself. Did you miss... It, is, it really is. Did you miss the lifestyle at all? Was it? Was there... You know, because when you get addicted to something like that, it's like heroin, man, where you end up, you know, needing that fix. You need that rush. And did you need that fix, or did you just go straight cold turkey? No, I mean... I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, whoever says that that lifestyle was a blast, they're friggin' lying to you. I mean, I had, I had I owned my own tour bus, and every stop, you know, there was three or four more girls, and we'd fly them out when we got to the next city, back, and pick up the new ones, and it was absolute madness. And I'm not going to say it wasn't a blast, and I didn't have a good time, and, you know, all the the wine women in fame, and driving Maseratis and Ferraris, and living in 40-acre ranches, and flying in helicopters and private jets, and, yeah, I mean, it was all cool, but... um. I don't know, man. Once I unplugged, I unplugged, and, and my old me came back pretty quickly. It was pretty amazing, and in reality, it was actually, it was refreshing, you know? I literally went to the, to the court and just and just said, you know what, I'm over it, and I handed it. I drove my Maserati to the Ferrari dealership and threw him the keys and walked out. 
I mean, I was literally, I didn't give, I didn't give a shit. I, I did not care. I left my, my $750,000 tour bus. I literally, it broke down on the side of the road with my driver. They called me in Thailand. I said, leave it there. I'm over it. They're like, what? And I said, just leave it. Leave it. Fly home. And they left it. I had no idea where it is now. I just didn't, I just got to a point that I just did not care. Was it a nervous breakdown, John? No, not at all. It wasn't a nervous breakdown. Like I said, man, I was sick. I got, um, I got so much stress that um, basically it turned my body against myself and my immune system was attacking my kidneys. And my kidneys shut down. I got to 340 pounds all of water. They told me I was going to die. Only two people have gotten out of Polk Hospital in Newport Beach with this, like me and a kid with lupus. And luckily I was so fit before I got it that I was able to cut. I was cutting... I went from 312 pounds to 320 pounds to, to 195 pounds in 30 days, and I lived. Wow. So with them finally, finally getting the cutters right, and, and I was peeing like two gallons of water a night. It was madness. Three gallons of water. It was crazy. So we were just kind of getting through it and um, hoping I didn't pass. And um, next thing you know, they threw me out on my tour bus, addicted to Vicodin, and said, have a good day. And that was that. So I knew I had to get myself off the drugs. I knew I had to get myself out, out of, uh, you know, away from the, the peer pressure and all that. And so I said, I'm going back to Thailand. If that's the place I'm going to, if I'm going to die, I'm going back to where I feel the most comfortable, you know. For people who don't understand, John, what is that peer pressure like? What does that stress feel like when you have to be on 24-7? There's no time for yourself. You can't shut yourself off. Yeah, you literally can't. I mean, my phone always rang. Like I said, I, was, I had between 1,500 and 2,000 texts a day, every single day. I was blown away. And um, you, the problem is that the, once you get to that level, everything that you do is looked upon as it has to be as good or as or better than the past. And when you're selling out arenas at 13,000 people, and, and back in the day, we're talking about 17, 18 years ago when there was three clubs in Vegas, to get, to get 13,000 people to that place when there was no nightclub draw, now there's 120 nightclubs, it was hard. And um, so everybody always looked at that, and then all the haters always wanted you to fail, you know? And it was, it was, it was hard pressure, man. It was, it was gnarly. It was no joke, for sure. I, I, I'm not, I don't miss it at all. I'm very happy to be in this, in this uh, chapter of my life now. When you decided to walk away, John, the media was after you from celebrity news like TMZ and all of those tattoo magazines. They were all after you. The the local radio stations, television stations, everybody wanted to know where you up and left. Were you happy yeah, to get I away mean, t- from the media scene? Yeah, I mean, they're blowing up. My publicity team was losing their mind, and um, I just told them no interviews. I mean, this is the first interview I've done in probably four and a half, five years, Dave. Um, I literally, and, and I'm sorry because I'm firing up a new brand, and, and you're my buddy, and I just, I just got so sick. I mean, we are doing between three and five to seven to eight media requests a week. It gets tiring. I mean, it's a constant, constant thing. And then they just go out and straight friggin' lie about you. I mean, and it's, you can never trust what's going to go out in the press. And I mean, I had a really good publicity team when I was with William Morris and all that, but it's it's always a battle. It's always a battle, and then, and then you go, you stand in the in the line at the friggin' at the friggin' uh, supermarket, and you know I'm sleeping with Britney Spears, or I mean it's just 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 so much crap all the time just to sell shit, and it just got old, man. And I was just so I just said, you know what? That's it. No press. That's it. I won't do anything. What was your favorite rumor that was about you? The Britney Spears one was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a pretty good one. That was a pretty good one. Um, there, there was one about me and, uh, and a tennis player back in the day, Anna Kornikova. That was, that was pretty damn good because she was dating my good friend Mark Wahlberg at the time. And, and so it got kind of awkward in that relationship. But, um, yeah, they've, 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 they've said some stuff, you know, and, and it's hurtful, man. And, and it hurts my mom, who's the most important person on earth to me. And, and you know, and it, it, the, the bad thing about the American public is that if it's, if it's written, it's believed, you know, and that's, and they, they need to realize, man, that to, to believe about one tenth of what you read and, and almost nothing of what you hear, you know, it's it's just uh, it's a bad game. But you know, when you, when you take that step and you do that, you sell your soul to the devil. And if you're a public figure, that's that's you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, and that's just kind of the way it goes. You mentioned that you sell your soul to the devil. Did you grow up religious and believing in God, the devil, and? What was your beliefs growing up in this whole spirituality of life? 
Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, no, I was raised very, very strict Roman Catholic by my mom and dad. I was actually in Catholic school my whole life, and I was an altar boy, the whole thing. And um, I just, uh, yeah, that was, that was my deal. And so uh, I finally I got busted by the, uh, by the courts and got, an, uh, got a charge for knuckling some dude in the parking lot for grabbing my chick, and I got, I got uh, uh, 40 hours of anger management and a year in jail. And so I did the hour, and the guy who I did, uh, luckily then I had money, and I, uh, I uh, picked this guy. I literally opened the phone book and picked the dude. His name was Jim Brown in Huntington Beach, and he was a Buddhist. And this was 20 years ago, 17 years ago, and he changed my entire life. How did you get started on the road to entrepreneurism? I mean, that started when I was a kid. I mean, I remember back in the day when I was young, my dad told me, so, I mean, literally, my dad put my truck in the driveway and siphoned the gas out of it when I was 15 and a half. And he said, if you want to see that thing move, you're going to go mow a lawn or do something because I'm not giving you a dime for gas. So I've done my job. And then my, he pulls my sister's convertible rabbit in and gives her a damn gas card. And he said that she'd be supported and I have to support. And so I literally went around and, and started signing up all the houses to do a, a lawnmower route. And I said, I think I was charging like five bucks a lawn or whatever, something silly. And then I paid another kid two fifty a lawn to do it, so I'd sit at home and still make two fifty a lawn and do no work. So that was kind of my first game, and it kind of went all the way through that, you know. And and um, I started in the restaurant game at fifteen and a half, which I still am now at fifty. And and um, I just realized that that I kind of like being a creator, so I create the brands and make them happen. And then once it gets big and it hits, I sell them, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that don't know how to create stuff, but they're more than happy to, to own something that's happening. So they'll come and buy it for you at a premium. John, when you got into the Vegas lifestyle, how did that all happen? And did it take off really quick, or was it something that you had to build up and work your ass off for? Oh, no. It blew up. Um, this was back. We were doing Pimp and Hell in Southern California, and then we finally took it to, um, to a club in Vegas back in the day called Club Utopia. And there's about a 4,000-person club, and we immediately sold it out at, like, 50 bucks a ticket. you got to remember, back then, there was only three nightclubs. There was Utopia, there was the beach, and then there was Club Rio at the Rio. There was nothing else. And so we literally started advertising outside of Vegas to bring the people to Vegas, and it just hit. So from there, we went to the, we went to the um, House of Blues, I believe. And then from there, we went to C2K, which is the in the Venetian. We sold that out and like left like 6,000 people outside. And then this kid, Billy Dickerson, came up to me and said, Hey, do you want to play the Mandalay Bay Arena? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, we'll give it to you for free. I looked at Damien, who was my partner at that time, and I said, what do you think? Do we got the balls to do this, or what are we going to do? And we said, why not? Let's do it. I mean, we were risk takers. We didn't care. You know? and, and we sold that thing out, 13,700 people, three, um, three weeks before the show. At $60 and $80 a ticket. So we did... I mean, you're talking about a seven hundred thousand dollar door. That's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. So, especially back in those days. So you basically built the club scene in Vegas to what it is today. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, but yeah, I mean, we were the first ones to bring electronic music into Vegas. We were the first ones that um, that uh, actually did all the big stuff in Vegas. Yeah, we were the ones that started all that crap and. Uh, I mean, I was the first. If I was the first promoter to ever tour Tiesto in the United States, um, nobody even knew who he was. I was getting him for like a thousand, two thousand dollars a show. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was really, really back in the day, and things have uh, have uh, definitely changed out there. I mean, I just found out that they have a Ferris wheel. <laughs> what is that? Five years ago? That's how. That's how unattached I am now. I hear you, man. And Tiesto has a nice big picture on the outside of the MGM Grand now. Oh yeah. They got them all signed up there now, huh? Those guys are getting paid crazy money now. It is. Because back in the day, before it started to take off, I mean, yeah, you had your lounge singers, maybe, you know, uh, a lot of the old school types, Donnie and Marie and, you know, Rodney Dangerfield when he was alive, the comedians would roll through town. But Vegas wasn't the party scene. When did you start to see Vegas start to switch? Um, I mean, it, it started to switch when we kind of hit it. I mean, we hit it probably, what would that be, in 92, maybe? Or, or nah, maybe 94 was when we st- really started to push Vegas a lot. And the reason why is because we just wanted to party all night. We didn't know. I mean, we did, me and Damien started all this stuff to get chicks, you know, and run amok. We didn't, we didn't do it to make money, just like why I started Hardin Huntington. It's just, it just happened that with my business sense and, and you know, and, and the amount of schooling I had, thank God for my parents, that I, I took it as a business and, 
and it went from there. I mean, we were the first nightclub to ever have a website, you know? I mean, you're talking about, I mean, Stone Ages, yeah? When you look back on it, do you just shake your head and laugh and say, those were some good times, or do you just look back and say, what the hell was I doing? No, nah, man, I look back and I said, damn, those were some good times. I mean, you got to understand, we were rolling bigger than Metallica. When we were rolling full force, we were rolling four tour buses, four 45-foot tour buses and ten semis. So you saw our train coming through the desert. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. You know, it was no joke. And and uh, it was it was a really big deal, and it was, oh, man, it was a blast. It was such a blast. And I wouldn't I wouldn't take it back for anything, but I, sh- I wouldn't go back for anything. I mean, it was it, it was great. It's not put in the memories. Nobody will ever repeat it. Um, it'll ne- those records will never be broken because the the the, uh, the people are too spread out now with the amount of clubs there are, so they can't do that type of numbers. But um, you know, I think that I think that we got those those records locked forever, and and that's 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 a cool thing, you know, and. And it's a cool thing for the Huntington name, you know, the city was named after my, my family, um, Huntington Beach and all that. So it's, 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 a, it's a cool another little feather in our cap as the Huntingtons as well. John, I'm going to get you to hold on. We're going to step out for a break here at the bottom of the hour. John Huntington is our guest. You know him from Vegas. You know him from Hart and Huntington Tattoos, inked on A&E, and now... Looking for a Zen as a Buddhist in Hawaii. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Hi there. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. Every Saturday and Sunday night. As Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness. You can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hey everybody, this is Patrick Webster Small, and I'm here to bring you the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night, live at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. If you're looking for aliens and extraterrestrials, well, we've got them. Big and tall, short and small, you're bound to find what you're looking for. So join me on the Webster Phenomena, right here on Space Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Have you ever wondered about those weird and strange creatures people have reported throughout history? Do you wonder if those stories are real? Me too, and that's why I started Cryptopia.us. Hey, this is Rob Morphy, crypto historian. Join me once a month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, where we will get into the odd and bizarre reports, from the Dover Demon to Harry Hominids and everything in between. I will break down what people like you and me are seeing at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. Spacedoutradio.com has an advertising tab that you can click on to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages. To play on radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Hi there. 
I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with the Four Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. Want to connect with us online? Find us on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, on YouTube, Spaced Out Radio Show, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. All right, space travelers, here comes the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the show, we'll be joined by longtime paranormal investigator S.J. Wells, talking about ghosts and hauntings starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, only at spacedoutradio.com. Remember, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. Find me on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, for our archives and our website is spacedoutradio.com while on the website be sure to read up on my latest blog by clicking on the blog tab this week i'm chatting about my dislike for the paranormal well sort of you can read on the sor space wire by news director eric markham check out our resident guitar god bumblefoot and you can join the space travelers club for just five bucks a month that's less than a starbucks coffee with your registration you get a private access to a section on our website you get names put in the monthly prize draws that'll happen the final friday of every month the first one is two days from now and you get access to private group interviews and more unlike the other guys we're giving you a hell of a lot more than just access to our archives everything can be found at spacedoutradio.com tonight we are joined by john huntington you know him from heart and huntington tattoos the vegas scene a and e's inked john welcome back yeah, how's it going? Good, man. Good to have you with us tonight to tell your story. I want to get into the tattoo part of everything because you're an inked up guy. You like your tattoos. When did you get your first tattoo? I actually, um, I waited till I was 30 years old for my mom. Uh, she is my best friend and my mentor, and she was like, "Hey, you should get a tattoo." So I went and got one. And uh, I mean, I, I people need to kind of know the background of that. I was, I was adopted, um, and so. My parents um, pretty much saved my life, and so my mom walks on water, and so does my father. And uh, what they what they want, they get. Um, my father was a, was a marine uh, MP and a Golden Glove boxer and a street thug, and my mom was this nice lady from Pennsylvania. And um, so I, I waited till I was thirty years old to to not disappoint them. And sure enough, I got my first one. My mom cried. I got my second one. My mom cried. I got my third one, my mom cried, but then after that, she just doesn't even care. She just wants me to come home. I mean, I just got three and a half hours uh, grinded in me yesterday in my neck. So she, uh, now she just asked what I got done next, and, and she wants to see pictures of it. She doesn't care. She just wants me to come home and see her. Are there any tattoos that you regret, or when you look around people, because ink is everywhere on almost everybody now, is there a place on a person's body that you? Is there a place on a person's body that you just think, no, man, don't get a tattoo there. Well, I mean, first thing, yeah, number one, don't tattoo your damn face. I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, it, it, this is this is the big issue right now. My shops never, you're never allowed to tattoo feet. You're never allowed to tattoo hands. You're never allowed to tattoo necks or face. So, uh, just for the simple fact that people come in drunk in my shops because they're in Vegas and they're in the in the casinos and all that stuff, I just didn't allow it. Um, I see it now, um, and, I mean, if I could take anything back, I'd take back my neck and my hands, but, I mean, I am who I am, and, and that's just what it is, and if you don't like it, then I'll work somewhere else, and I'll just beat you at your game with someone with another company, so that's not my problem. The problem that I have and that I see now is that all these young kids, 18, 19, 20 years old, going into these tattoo shops because they see all the old school guys like us flying these tattoos, and they think it's cool to tattoo their hands and necks, and they don't even know what the hell they're going to do for their lives. I mean, they've lost their damn minds, and now they're tattooing cheeks and, and everything else. When I, when I got sleeved um, back then, you were either in the, in, the, in the Navy or you were a friggin' thug. You are coming out of prison, so it was very individualized. Now it's very much a cool thing to be, and 
I, I just it's just it's just really really a problem. Um, and, and a big part of that was was when ink hit. When ink hit, the literally the tattoo industry went up fifty percent. And I mean the entire tattoo industry went up fifty percent from when the TV show hit. And so <clears throat> that's a pretty big deal, you know. And, and like right now, there's fifty percent once the baby boomers die off, fifty percent of America will be tattooed, and fifty percent of them will want another one. It is huge business. And if you want to be in really big business right now, open a tattoo removal shop. I mean, it's that that's the game. But yeah, man, hands and neck and uh, and face, unless you're pretty much financially secure, is, is a no-no as far as I'm concerned. So let's get started. You, you did you start Hart and Huntington tattoos first, or did you start Huntington tattoos first? No, I started Hart and Huntington Tattoo Company first. Um, what happened was George Maloof, who was a dear friend of mine, the owner of the Palms. I was I, I had the exclusivity for all the DJs back then in, in the Palms Casino, and so so George came to me, and the Hard Rock was just coming online, and they just did a refurbish, and he's like, "You better do something super cool." That, that, that nobody else has done and, and, that, and beat people at the game. I said, dude, let's do a tattoo shop. He told me I was nuts. We were in front of the gaming commission, and the gaming commission basically asked George to go, I mean, if this kid screws up, you're going to lose your casino. You know, I mean, everybody's going to walk into these casinos with open wounds, the whole thing. And George literally looked at me and asked me if I was going to screw up. He had that much trust in me. When I said no, he said, no, we're going to do it. So I called up Hart, uh, my best friend at that time, Kelly Hart, and, uh, and, uh, we decided to put, it, put in a heart in Huntington at the, uh, at the Palms, and off we went, you know. And that was the first one out of seven in, in three countries, and, and it went bananas, you know. Once, once the TV, I had a TV show called The Producer that I was filming. We backed that out, and we really, we really did it as inked. And um, I, I uh, wrote it and executive produced and started it. And that hit A&E on the half hour, and the other half hour was either Dog the Bounty Hunter or Chris Angel, and it went bananas. I mean, bananas. It, the, the place just went, it went crazy. And that's when everything changed. What was it like when you were talking to television producers and A&E? What was their reaction when you said, I'm going to bring tattoos mainstream, I want to bring them to television, tell the stories. How did they look at you and how did they react to this? Well, it was, it was awesome because they looked at me like it was just going to be a bunch of fuck-ups. I mean, this is, this is online radio, I can say that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they didn't seem like us, like, we just gave me a bunch of fuck-up, you know, tattoos, and they, they wanted to catch all the drama. In reality, I mean, I know the business game pretty damn good, and and we came in and we did it proper. We built, a, we built, a, built out a 700 square foot tattoo shop for $250,000. I mean, most tattoo shops pay about ten grand to open. I mean, this place was top of the line. Everything was, I mean, just this shit. It was all cutting edge. Um, we had the hottest employees. We had the hottest artists. I mean, we had guys like Ben Korn and Steve Soto and freaking Clean Rock One and, and Thomas Pendleton, all the old school gangster freaking tattoo artists. I'm Macy and, and, and I mean, just, just like Deja and, and just these killers that were out there just tattooing. And I mean, we were crushing that, 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 that 700 square feet was doing $4.3 million a year, that one shot, just that one shot. I mean, everybody had to have a Hart and Huntington tattoo. I remember before I knew that you were actually out of the game, I remember texting you from Vegas in the Hard Rock saying, dude, are you still part of this? Because if I'm going to get inked, I'm going to get inked at one of your stores and not somewhere else because I wanted my money right. to go to you. And you're like, no, man, I'm not a part of it yeah, anymore. No, I, yeah, no, that's, that's, what happened was it, was it, it just blew up. And I had my eye on Costa Rica, again, going back to being that surfer guy. I, go to Costa, I went to Costa Rica all the time then. And I went down there, and, and it was this little 14-seat sushi shop that was up for sale. So um, what happened was that when I was in when I was in Vegas, it hit, and my, my my all my agents sat me down at William Morris. They go look at Huntington. They go, right now you're a name. Nobody knows your face, so you're, you're cool. Once you cross this threshold, your life's over. It's going to change instantly the next day, and and I don't think you quite understand that. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever, blah 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 blah. Well, that night the show aired, the pilot aired. The next day I was flying to Costa Rica with my chick from out of LAX my chick at that time and uh i had no idea who it was actually yeah i do it was, <laughs> uh, it was the model we used for all the billboards and stuff yeah i was smoking ass girl named christine and she was the girl that, that did all the billboards and everything so we were flying out the next day out of lax and i literally got mobbed i mean it was gnarly they had to get security to drag me through the security and back then they didn't have all this nine, uh, you know post 9 11 crap but they literally had to surround me with security to get me through the airport and get me out 
And that's never what I kind of signed up for. So I landed down in Costa Rica, and, um, you know, the pilot had aired, and, and we're kind of wondering how it did as far as ratings and stuff. And next thing you know, I called my agency. And my agency goes, guess what, dude? You just got 16 episodes. And I go, you know what? I'm going to call you back in 15 minutes. I, I hung up the phone, and, and this is to give you an idea. Back then, Costa Rica didn't have cell phones, so I was talking on a pay phone. I hung it up. I went and walked on the beach. I went back, I called my agency back, and I go, yo, um, I quit. And they go, wow, what? <laughs> and I just go, they dropped me 16 episodes at 20 grand an episode. I go, you know what, fuck it, I quit, I'm out. And they were tripping. The A&E started tripping, Fox Studios started tripping, who was the people behind it. And I stayed down in Costa Rica for about three weeks or four weeks just thinking about this whole thing while they're blowing me up, telling me that i got to come back to talk about the show and stuff. And finally, they sent me a private plane down there to get me out and because uh, I told them I wouldn't go through the airport. So they threw a jet in. They flew me out and uh, I landed back in L.A. to the private airport. They put me in the car and they rushed me to the agency. And, um, yeah, I told them, look it, I'm out. I, I will not do it anymore. They go, we're offering you 20,000 an episode. They operated up. They went up to 25,000 an episode. Uh, with a guarantee of three years of 16 episodes. You know, I mean, basically, what does that work out to? I, I, I turned down probably a million and a half dollars, and um, I just said, nah, I'm over it. So I sold it all. I sold the show. I called Hart. I sold the shops, and I took all my money, and I flew to Costa Rica. And I bought the, the, little, the little restaurant, and I took my restaurant knowledge, and I blew it up to 120-seat sushi bar. And I lived there for about seven years, flying back and forth to my clubs and stuff, and then Hart was screwing up at the Palms, and so Maroof called me, and uh, they were kicking out Hart and Huntington, and Maroof called me and said, hey, man, you want to come back and build Huntington Link in here? They want to come back and build a shop in the same space, and I go, yeah, why not? Um, Hart had done me dirty and stole a bunch of money from me and stuff, so I said, all right, what up? Let's go, let's go back in and get our game on. So I, that's when I flew back into Vegas and actually lived in the Palms for about five years and, uh, and built Huntington Inc., and then that's when I wrote a show that is now Ink Masters. We wrote the show. Um, VH1 actually picked it up, and then that that crazy ass dude went and he met that girl on that game show, and he killed her and cut her fingers off, and then he went up into Canada and hung himself or some shit. Anyway, that that that's when VH1 dropped all of their programming, all their all of their their, um, their reality programming. So the show got dropped, and the next year another show got stolen, and now it's back up with uh, with Ink Masters and Dave Navarro on that. So quite a quite a crazy past, man. How did you get involved with Carrie Hart? Because that relationship on the television show was always seeming very tumultuous. Me and Carrie were actually best friends for eight years before that. Carrie and I met on the Kid Rock video, Ball with the Ball, the dang, the dang. Carrie was doing all the jumping, and, and, and Kid Rock was driving my custom Cadillac and the whole thing. And Carrie and I were boys for about eight years. He got smashed up on Huck Jam, and so I brought him in to, uh, to work on the shots with me. But they were originally going to be Huntington Inc., and I switched it over to Hart and Huntington, and, and that was that. And then, uh, yeah, once once money started getting involved, shit got weird. And, and, I mean, as you can see about me, I don't give a shit. So I was just like, whatever, you know. And I think he was a little pissed that I was leaving because I was the businessman behind it. And and um, then I just said, fuck you, I'm out. And I sold it all, and I bounced. So, whatever. I, have I don't a give a shit. I have a question from Noel in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. She's asking, John... You've been quite inspirational to many, including myself. Are you ever going to come out with a book or an audio book, perhaps? Uh, hey, Noel, what's up? Yeah, um, I've actually been approached by Endeavor and a few other places to actually do a book a bunch of times. I'm just too damn lazy to write it. So if any of those writers out there want to come and write my book, let me know. I just, even even though the money I've literally been offered, like a couple million bucks, I just won't write it. I just don't give a shit. So for me to have to sit down for a couple of years and actually write my entire book, and then do a bit. I wanted to do a business book called The Speed Businessman, and I just never got around to doing it. And then they started throwing around. They wanted to get my rights to do a, do a, a movie about my life and all that. And I mean, to tell you the truth, I mean, it really comes down to this. I can't be fucking bothered, man. I, I got there's waves coming. I gotta go surf. I just I just don't care, you know. But if there's someone out there that wants to come and sit with me for a year and, and just pick my brain and write a book and be my partner in it, so be it. But. If you want me to sit down and take away my time, I mean, I'm watching the sunset right now with my feet up drinking a beer at Bongo Ben's in Kona, Hawaii. I'm going to write a book, or I'm going to be present and sit here and talk to people like you, and I just, I just don't give a shit anymore, you know? So, um, I wouldn't hold your breath in a while, but it's not like it's going to be impossible. It would happen if I get a writer that would want to come out and do it. 
When you look around and you still see people wearing Hart and Huntington tattoo shop shirts, I mean, they're still very, very, <laughs> I very popular. I just, saw, I just saw one in the airport the other day, and they have no idea it's me standing behind them. It's, it's freaking awesome. I, I, was, uh, I was dating this chick, this local chick here, Chantel, and yeah, and I, and I saw it the other day, and it was freaking hilarious. Yeah, I, I see them all the time. And people, they, people come in the restaurant wearing my shit, and they have no idea it's me running the restaurant. It's, it's classic. Do you enjoy that though? Like seeing your name yeah, everywhere? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's a, that was a badass brand. That brand was no joke. We were in uh, six thousand stores worldwide. We were the top selling t shirt in, in all of Australia. Um, I mean, that brand was no joke. And and I mean, it, even if I'm not involved anymore per se, I mean, I still have my I still get paid my licensing rights for my name. I mean, my name's still on the side of a casino in Vegas and a motocross team and everything else. So. People can run their mouth all they want and tell their names up in life like that. They can suck it. And that's really the attitude that you have to have, is you have to have the big balls. You have to have the strength to be able to just say to hell with everybody else because otherwise like you said earlier, people are going to take advantage of you and your name because your name is a product. Oh yeah, I mean, if you try to go, oh, yeah, my name is a licensed trademark of, my, of me. I, I, I own my name. Nobody can use my name without my permission. And, and, um, and it's a battle. And, and if people are going to come in here and they're, and they're going to be a bitch and they're going to worry about what everybody says, shoot, you're in the wrong game. I mean, this game is it basically, what, the, the way that we roll this game, this is what my agent said. They go, John, don't give a shit what they're saying about you. And they stop talking about you. That's when you start worrying. And that's kind of what the way I've been. And, and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, you know, the Tommy Lee attitude where it doesn't matter what the fuck you do, no matter how gnarly it is, if you're in the press, you're winning. And, and, and you know, it's, it's kind of just that way. I, I, I just, I don't give a shit what anybody says about me. I know who I am as a person. I'm, I, I've earned my right to be here. And, um, you know, I, I get, you know, there's people that talk shit about me all over Kona. I, I don't care, whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. My name's still on the casino, so whatever. That, that's got to be a rush, man, because when you see your name everywhere, like you said, you're at the airport and you see this guy standing right in front of you wearing a Huntington, Hart and Huntington shirt. I mean, at any time, have you ever just walked up to someone, poked them on the on the shoulder or something, and said, hey, do you want me to autograph that for you? <laughs> nah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that guy. I mean, I, I get rushed. Every, I actually got rushed a couple of days ago from some guys that found out I was here to sign some stuff, but I don't ever walk up to that. I'm... I'm more of the guy that kind of stands in the background and kind of, I'm, I'm not a big attention hog and I don't really care about that shit, but I mean, back in the day when I was on TV, I couldn't even have lunch or, I couldn't have a meal with my chick or I couldn't, I couldn't do anything or go anywhere without being bombed and that was one of the reasons why I left the game. It was just, there's no anonymity and I'm not even close to these fools like friggin', you know, these basketball players or, or any of these other people or, and I can't even imagine. I mean, I, I was best friends with Chuck Liddell for years, and God damn, trying to hang out with that guy was just, it was, it was a pain in the ass, or me and George Clooney were close, and all these guys that I used to kick it with, you know, and it's just too much. It's just nothing I want to be involved with, involved with really, and, and if it's a little bit of the answer that I have to deal with, then so be it, you know. But I, I always try to put out a good message, and I always try to be humble, and I try to, try to you know, walk softly, but I sure as hell carry a big stick. Do you miss that celebrity style, though? I'm not saying, like, getting bothered 24-7, but do you miss hanging around with the guys? Like you said, George Clooney, Chuck Liddell. The, the, the thing is that you guys seem like that. I mean, that's just my voice. Yo, Chuck, what are you doing today? You know what I mean? And, and it wasn't me. We just hung out with each other because we all felt you kind of dealt with the same problems. Chuck and I were best friends for a long time. I threw all of his after parties for the UFC. We started the after party game for the UFC and all that, so, I mean, these guys are truly my boys, you know, and so, it's not like it was, it was like, hey, there's George, or hey, there's, you know, John, or whatever, or Chuck, and it was, it was just, you know, we had nicknames for each other, and, and, and it was the same shit as any other guy does, you know, you freaking sock each other, you, you wake up, you put your pants on one leg at a time, and kick the chicks out of the room, and they're gamble, that's just the way it is. So, getting back to the tattoo, would you re- like to get back into the tattoo game? you said that oh. um, I'm torn right now um, I know that my brand would do real well here in Hawaii we actually had Hart and Huntington in Oahu for, for nine years in the mall that it was enclosed and just never got rebuilt um, so I'm not against it but I haven't sold myself on it yet 
Um, I, right now, it'll be a no comment. Now, I'm not against it, and I'm not in it. I mean, if there's anybody out there that wants to come and partner with me and throw a bunch of capital at it and, and, and rock and roll, I'd be willing to put my brand on it, you know? But um, as far as me putting out my personal money and doing all that, uh, I'm not in a position that I need to risk. I'm, I'm cruising. So that, all that does is add stress to your life, and, and what are you going to do, get more money? Well, how many lots can you water ski behind? I'm just not... I'm just not into it. I don't care. I mean, I drive. A, I, I drive. A, to give you an idea, I went from driving Maseratis and Ferraris and Lamborghinis, and then they had helicopters land on my ranch. So I drive now an '86 Bronco, a lifted '86 Bronco, and I ride a, 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 um, a, a 250 Enduro. Those are those are what I drive around now. It's not because I can't afford anything. It's because I just don't give a shit. Do you still have that killer instinct, though, for business? Because there's a big difference between giving it all away like you did to all of a sudden coming straight through and saying, I want to rebuild an empire. Yeah, well, I mean, well, as you know, one of the reasons why I did this show was, and I, don't know, I know we're going to talk about this later, later, but I just signed a major deal with the largest motorcycle company in the world. And, uh, and this is going to be my new game. This is going to be a monster, Dave, I'm telling you. And I'm going to put the entire Huntington you know, family behind it, and I'm going to put my agency behind it and everything and like you said I'm turning the wheels up and that's why I'm on your show now and, and I might as well tell them that I signed with Harley Davidson I'm going to be doing I'm building a new company called Huntington Hawaii and Harley Tours and what it is is uh, basically I have the exclusivity with, uh, with Big Island Harley and Harley of Kauai um, that I'm going to be leading all of the tours around the island so when you fly into Hawaii you rent a, a chopper and uh, I'll take you on tours or one of my employees will take you on tours around the island telling you all the different lore and, and stories and, and just pointing out all the different places and all that stuff for you. So right now I've got Kauai and I've got the big island on lock and I'm working on Maui and Oahu. Those are next and um, I've already got it pretty much locked up and uh, this is going to be my new thing and I think it's going to be a really, really big brand and I'm going to get paid to ride friggin' choppers all day so I'm, I'm pretty cool with it. That's a pretty nice lifestyle, riding Harleys in the middle of the sun of Hawaii, along the beaches, wherever you're going on a tour. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that don't suck. I'm, I'm okay with it. So, yeah, that, that, that's my next game right now that I'm working on. And then um, I'm managing. i got a couple of really good friends out here named Manny and Paul. And I'm managing their restaurant, Bongo Ben's here. That's literally right on the beach. I'm sitting in it right now. Um, I'm the GM here, and we've got this place kicking ass and taking names. And it's, it, I mean, it's right on Lee Drive on the, sand, on the beach. And I've got... About 50 great employees, and I mean, I've, I've fallen in love with the place. And I mean, they, even them come, they come to me all the time. They're going, "What are you doing here? Why aren't you out running something like crazy?" You know what I mean? And it's a 140 seat restaurant, and it's got a great bar, and but it's on the beach, man, in Kona. And they take good care of me financially, and and you know, so I'm here. And, and I love what I do. I love customer service. I'm the personality of the restaurant. I greet every single person that comes in. I say goodbye to every single person. And they have no idea of my past or who I am because that stuff's so old now. But every once in a while you get the creepers. But it's, it, 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 you know, it gets me up in the morning, you know. I, I, you know, as my chick just, uh, as my ex chick, chick that uh, uh, we, we just split up and, and, and she used to say, God, you work so hard. Like, you go to work every day. Every single day you go to work. And, and it's the truth. I go to work every day. That's what I do. I, I love to work. It's, it's my game, you know. When you went to Thailand and you decided to take some time off and really find yourself. Was the ocean calling you and the peace and zen of the ocean really needing to be with you again? Yeah, 100. I mean, I was a competitive swimmer and water polo player my entire life. Um, I was like, I was surfing since I was five. Um, my dad was a surfer. My dad's dad was a surfer. Huntington Beach was named after my family. And Surf City, USA. You know, it doesn't get any deeper than that. And, and so... Yeah, man. I mean, I, I've got gills. And, and so for me to go down there, I actually took off and went down there and went back. I, I, I became a dive instructor, and I went back. I mean, I've been a yacht captain for 25 years. I went back to driving boats, and and um, it was fucking awesome, man. I was down there for about two and a half, three years, and then I got transferred up to the Cayman Islands, and I lived over there for about a year and a half, two years, and I jumped on this company called the Aggressor Company, which is a big yacht, liveaboard dive, dive boats. So I was running one over there, and then I got, I got it to Honduras, and I got sent over here to Kona, Hawaii, I hated the boat, so I got off the boat, but I loved Kona. Kona's exactly like Southern California, slow-paced, chill, awesome, and um, I decided this is where I was going to settle down. So um, I got back into the restaurant game, got off the boats, and, um, and uh, yeah, that's that. I'm, I'm now here, and I had a great relationship up until a couple of days ago or a day ago, and that just kind of blew up in my face, but 
whatever it is what it is, you know, and the good thing about, about doing this kind of stuff is that you don't have to worry about chicks, you know, so they, they, that, that's the easy part, so it's, um, you know, it is what it is, and, and I'm, I'm ready to chill and settle down and, and kind of do my thing, and, and um, you know, I'm going to create this new brand and put my feet up and watch it grow, and I'm cool right now, Dave, like, I'm good, like, I, I, I guarantee you this, I've been on the mainland maybe eight days in the last five years. Um, I don't see myself going back anymore. Um, and I don't see myself and my ex-chick getting back together anymore. So I, I see, I, I think that everything's going to be moving forward. And and I think that uh, that my eyes are wide open and whatever comes, comes. And, and, and away we go, you know? And that's the way it has to be for you right now because that's what's bringing you your own personal success. That's what's bringing you... Uh, smiling back on your face. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and that's it. I mean, uh, like, like I said, I mean, right now I'm sitting in the middle of a bunch of customers so I'm tripping out on me because I'm talking on the phone like I'm on a radio interview and they don't really know that I actually am on a worldwide radio interview. Um, but, um, yeah, man, I mean, you know, life delivers you crazy challenges. And, you know, I'm really working on my yoga base right now with this um, awesome lady, Saifan Woosley. And, uh, and I'm really working on that right now. And, and I'm, I'm kind of just doing my thing and I'm getting my center and I'm uh, and I'm um, cruising like everything's okay everything's okay I look forward to waking up every day and um, and I do my thing you know and, and I come to work and I see all my employees smiling faces and their, their sun kiss faces and they've been surfing for the last you know yesterday because there's waves and and I'm watching a crazy ass bum in the middle of the street right now throwing his shoes around at cars and I mean, life's bitching it's all good on that note, we're going to hop out for a break at the top of the hour. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. John Huntington is our guest tonight, formerly of Hart and Huntington Tattoos. His name all over Vegas. Maybe you've seen him in a concert. And now you can go visit him in Hawaii at his new Harley Hawaii Tours. It's going to be a good one. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio on the Spreaker.com network. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Do you believe you've been in contact with extraterrestrial? Have you seen the greys, the mantis, or the reptilian? I am Samantha Mullet, and on the second Tuesday of each month, you can listen and learn from my experiences with off-worlders on Spaced Out Radio's The E.T. Experience. With host Dave Scott, we'll sit down and chat about what's going on with our friends from other worlds. We'll also try to answer your questions. So please, tune in on the second Tuesday of the month, only on Spaced Out Radio. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com where I, 
Benson Zunza and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Attention, Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to a private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. Right here, this is where we divulge the fruit of our research. Here on the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Pacific. 11 p.m. Eastern on Space Tower Radio, and we give it up to you guys, all the listeners and the live listeners. You can get something special and hang out in the chat room, and uh, we love to have you. So we'll see you every Saturday night at 8 p.m. You know where. If you're a fan of social media, you can follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S O R. Our YouTube channel, where our archives are stored, is Spaced Out Radio Show. And of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Okay. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Remember, tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, we will be joined by S.J. Wells. We are going to be talking about everything paranormal tomorrow night. And that's at spacedoutradio.com. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, for our archives. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While you're checking out our website, check out our resident guitar god, Bumblefoot, by clicking on his banner. You can read up on the S-O-R Space Wire with news director Eric Markham of the Stories of the Weird and Obtuse. Check out my blog on the paranormal this week, and you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. We get your name into monthly prize draws. The first prize draw is this Friday as well. You get access to a private group, interviews, private section on our website, and so much more. All the details at spacedoutradio.com. Tonight we are talking with John Huntington. You may know him from Las Vegas and the party days. This is the guy who put the Vegas party scene on the map. John, welcome back. Yeah, what's up, Dave? How did you get involved with the MMA? MMA Uh, really took off, man. Yeah, it really did. I was involved back in the day. I started um, studying uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in probably about... Uh, 91 or 92 um, with uh, with uh, Sensei Paulo uh, Gazi Jr. out there in Southern California and uh, did that for, for many years and then uh, I actually ended up getting uh, Tiki Gosselin got a hold of me and got me uh, t- together with John Lewis out of Las Vegas who's Nova Nyao uh, Jiu Jitsu and uh, so him and I we sat down and we kind of started talking and we wanted to build an MMA show that was going to have a nightclub kind of feel with go-go's in the room and, and stuff like that. I, I mean, I mean, it was a, it was a great idea. So we kind of did we did a thing called the, <clears throat> the World Fighting Alliance. It was kind of where the fight club meets the nightclub and and it did really well with uh, we did the Hard Rock and we did Aladdin and we did a few shows. We had Ice Tea order um, um, Ice Tea um, open some. And we had some, I mean, like Rich Franklin started with us. A lot of guys started with us back in the day. We had the contracts. And so we blew these shows up, got them on TV. And the next thing I know, I got a knock on the door, and USC is uh, sending over an offer to buy us. So we built the company. We did, uh, we did um, three shows, and we sold it for north of $3 million. What do you think of the Maloof selling the UFC now for $4 billion? I mean, I think that that is... Mind blowing, mind blowing. I mean, <laughs> God damn it, man! Why didn't I do that? Yeah, that it's them and Dana. I mean, Dana really made that brand, and he did a great job with it. And um, Dana's a good dude. He's always been good to me, and and um, you know, it was, it was, it was. It's a really big deal, you know, and then it's huge for the sport because the company that bought it can take it to the next level and um, and it's really going to be I, I want to see where it goes I mean it, it's unbelievable how bad it's you know it's beat up boxing and 
and uh, the sport has gotten huge. I hope they take it back down a notch to where they're not doing as many shows because they're kind of blowing it out. And uh, they, they do maybe one a month or something like that. But um, we'll see what happens, you know. But then what happened was when I started the World Fighting Alliance, I got in, involved with Chuck. Um, and Chuck and I actually met on a – we went over to Amsterdam to, to teach uh, jiu-jitsu to a bunch of Dutch guys. And we were over there doing that. And next thing you know, him and I are buddies. And so we came back, and he was just then starting to fight in the UFC. And so I started talking to him back, and it's like, I think it was ranked 11th or something. And I jumped in, in bed with him and started doing all those after parties. And so I was there in the struggle of us trying to get up to get that Tito Ortiz fight in the beginning. And Tito dodged us for years and years and years. And finally, we, uh, we got that fight, and that's when we won the championship, and that's when it all changed. It went from us getting $3,000 a party to fifty, fifty-five thousand dollars $55,000 a party. And, and uh, yeah, it, it really got big then. And that's when, you know, we were doing the MGM Grand and, Mandalay Bay, and it was uh, it was good times, man. Good times. I mean, I can tell you, Chuck and I have had some times, and I will never say a word. What do you think about the allure of the UFC? Is for a lot of people, it's it's enraged human cockfighting, whereas for others, nah, man, this this is what it is, Dave. It's the truth. It's the fucking truth. They put two guys in the ring, they lock the fucking cage, and they go. And it's the truth. And that's why everybody loves it. You know what I mean? And and boxing, everybody knows what a joke it is. And, and, and back in the day, it wasn't. But it's so fixed and so messed up. And so there's too many promoters' hands in the game and too much shit. And that's where MMA has kind of come to. But back in the early days, and, and UFC, you know, 11, 12, 13, 15, 20, it was the truth. And that's why it got real. Do you miss the old days of the UFC when it was basically bare knuckles and just go all hell in the cage? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I miss the days of the no weight class where you see a guy like 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 Hoist fighting, uh, uh, you know, who weighs maybe a buck sixty, soaking wet, fighting a four hundred eighty pound sumo wrestler, because you're truly matching style against style, and that's what it was originally started was was the fight was to, it was to go jujitsu against against sumo or jujitsu against Krav Maga or whatever the hell they're going against the Kempo or whatever. And that's how why it started. And it didn't matter about the size of the athlete. It was about the art against the art. And, yeah, I missed that. I missed those days. Um, now it's, it's all too regimented and all too – everybody comes right in at 155 or they come right in at 185 or they come right in at 205. And, 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 and you know, and the other thing is everybody's so damn good now at MMA. They all know all, a little bit of every art. They're the big knockouts that there used to be back in the day when – when Kempo didn't hold a friggin' uh, a light to, to, to whatever, and, and, and guys were just getting clobbered. And that was when it was like, holy shit, you know, people were going to die. It was nuts. I got a couple questions coming in from our audience members here, if you don't mind, John. Yeah, no worries. Noel is asking, how much of a change from Vegas to Thailand was it? <laughs> Night and day. Um... I mean, although you got to tell Thailand is a very, very big house scene, yeah? I mean, we, we used to hang out on, we go and, and we dive all day, and then we go, there's all these really cool, groovy-ass little beach bars with pillows on the beach, and, and just, you just go lay in these pillows, and there's just friggin' hot chicks walking around with no shirts on, and, and I mean, all the European girls are there, and, and just groovy-ass house music, and just, I mean, it, it was Thailand is something to experience, and if you live there for a good two, three years, you really get dug in. It, it really it blows your mind. You fall in love with Thailand. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made was leaving Thailand. I wish I never did. You fell in love with it that much. Was it the combination um, of was it the yeah. combination of the party scene and the the Buddhist feeling that everybody is at peace, everybody is in love, everybody just has respect. Well, I mean, it's just—it's just everything. I mean, the, the entire society is about peace and, and love, and, and everybody namaste when they see each other. And, and I mean, it's just a whole different thing. It's just a whole different. There's nothing more different than from the United States than than, than Thailand. And it's just it, when you're into and when you're into Asia the way I am, and you're into the Asian style and the Asian arts and, and all the things that happen Asia. Um, Man, Thailand is just its just the shit. It's just the coolest thing ever. And I think that I probably will end up back there one day. Um, I, I don't know when, but uh, 
she's definitely drawing me. I've, I've been back probably seven or eight times already, you know, training Muay Thai and doing the different things down there. And, and so she's definitely calling me to come back, and I'll definitely be back again. For sure. For sure. When you, getting back to the MMA side for a second here, when you first got involved, did you ever expect it to blow up the way it did once Dana White and the Maloofs took over with Zufa? No, not at all. I mean, it was a miserably failing business from the very beginning. They bought it, I think, for $3 million, and they had to dump 47 or $57 million into it before it started making money. So, I mean, it was a miserable failure. Everybody thought it was going to go BK, and then all of a sudden it just switched. The, the lights went on, and, and, uh, and everybody started watching MMA, and... Uh, and away they went. I think you got to understand, they bought a company for $3 million and they sold it for $4 billion. I mean, and that's $400 million. I mean, what, $4,000? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's mind-boggling, the amount of money. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, yeah, yeah, they, they did okay on that brand. I want to switch gears. Let's take you back to Thailand here. And I'm going to tell you a little story here to get a little freaky. The last time I actually talked anything to do with Buddhist and Buddhism on this show, I can tell you the date. It was April 20th of 2015. And John, let me tell you what happened. And I know you got a lot of people around that are listening to this, and they're probably going to call bullshit on this. But God's honest truth, swear on my children's lives, this happened. I'm broadcasting the show. I'm literally 10 minutes in, and I've got a studio in my home. And my studio is right by my front door. And I see something move out the window as I'm talking. And all I'm thinking is, oh, great. Somebody's going to come to my door. I've just started the show. My dogs are going to start barking because I have a Chihuahua Dash Hunt cross that, you know, she barks at everything. for, And it's at least 15, 20 minutes worth of barking. So I ask my guest that night, a gentleman named Harvey Kraft about how you doing, how did you get into Buddha? He starts answering, I put my microphone on mute, and I turn to look to see who is out the window. I forgot to turn my outside lights on. And God is my witness, John. I turned, looked out the window, which is maybe, the window is maybe three and a half feet away from me, and on the other side of that window is an extraterrestrial gray standing there staring back at me. Come on! I swear to God. I damn near fell Come off on. my I damn near fell off my chair. I'll never forget that giant gray head and the big black eyes. You're, you're so full of shit. Give me a break, dude. I am. That's like that's like that's like me seeing Bigfoot walk down the Leaky Drive right now. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting into Bigfoot with you later because I know you are absolutely <laughs> no, you are. chicken shit about that. Okay. Dude, I am, well, I've seen the fucker. Yeah, I'm chicken shit. He's scary. Okay, I've seen Bigfoot too. He wasn't scary to me, man. I, no. saw, I saw it too. But honestly, I know that sounds like absolute crap and something right out of a, a fictional sci-fi, but God's honest truth, you can listen to the tape, you can hear me freaking out if you go back That's in the Spaced crazy. Out Radio archives. So that is, li- that is literally the last time that I have talked Buddha on this show. So Yeah, so you, I guess you better watch out tonight, Dave. Well, I've got a window right in front of me, man, and I am watching <laughs> I am watching that window profusely right now. But anyways If you wake up and your butt's a little sore, you'll know what happened. Well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh well I, I'm not going there. I'm I've been lucky I've been lucky so far. Knock on wood, I've been lucky so far. Anyways right. you grew up Roman Catholic. You change into a Buddhist. When did you start to make that change? Well, like I said, I mean, I was I was always a street thug, and uh, and some dude freaking grabbed my chick and and uh, thought he was a big guy, and I fucking took care of him, knocked him out, and put him on the on the pavement. He ended up having to stutter for the rest of his life, so I got a major assault and battery. I got locked up for a year, and uh, and uh, I got forty hours of anger management. But back then, luckily, I had money, so I uh, I. Uh, Look through the phone book. I opened the phone book and I went right to this guy named Jim Brown in Huntington Beach. And I went into him and I said, "Look, I got to do forty hours of anger management. About one hundred and fifty dollars an hour." And um, he was a Buddhist, and I actually ended up doing sixty hours with him of privates. And he changed my entire life. 
it was um if, if it wasn't for him, I'd be locked up or dead right now, one hundred percent, without a doubt. So when you sit there and you start learning the teachings of Buddha, what was your biggest attribute that you gained from starting to learn Buddhism? My biggest thing was was, was to to let go. Um, forgiveness and, and is freedom, and acceptance is freedom, and, and those two things I live by every single day. And I've had so many people that have burned me in my life. You know, one of them being Hart, and uh, you know, he sold almost two million bucks for me, and. And I just literally, I, I, I just don't care. You know what I mean? If I sat here and harped on it, it would be my, I'd be something I'm carrying for the rest of my life. And so, like I said, forgiveness is freedom and acceptance is freedom. I mean, I'm going through, through a breakup right now with somebody who's very, very dear to my heart. And um, I have to accept it. She's not coming back. It's over. And I need to move forward. And that's that. And so I'm free. And, and and if I and if you know if, if I wasn't going to accept that, I would be harping on it and <clears throat> and all that, and, and it's over. I, I'll probably never contact her again. I'll probably maybe might cross her path in the in the yoga studio or something like that, but it's over. And I've accepted that. And acceptance is one hundred percent freedom. It's when you don't accept. It's when you attach that things that things harm you. You know, and and this whole word hate. It's such a confusion to everybody because for you to hate somebody, you have to understand you have to love them to hate them. So you have a mixed emotion with this person because if you truly are put off by somebody, you just don't give a shit <clears throat> because you don't love them. So you're just like whatever, they're gone. You know what I mean? Whatever. Poof. I don't hate heart. I don't hate. I don't hate my ex-wife who cheated on me. I don't hate any of that stuff. I, I, I just. I just don't care. You know what I mean? It's over. I've forgiven them and I've moved forward and I don't carry that burden anymore. And for me, that's the biggest thing that I've gained from Buddhism because back in the day, I used to carry a lot of anger and I used to carry a lot of things because I carry that with me. And um, so, so those are, those are, I mean, it, it's life-changing and life-saving, you know? But you have to, you have to come to peace. I'm going to miss Chantel forever and, and it's going to happen that way, but but we'll never be back together. It's, it's just Liz, and that's that. And I'm going to move forward, and and another beautiful, amazing woman will be in my life, I'm sure, very soon. And so, so be it. You know, she served a purpose in my life, and and that purpose, I guess, is now over as far as the universe is concerned. And now you have to realize that when every door closes, a new door opens, and you have to step through that door to keep continuing on life. And if you don't, then you're stuck in actually what you would probably consider the afterlife, like a, a backward cycle. And you need to let go. You need to just not attach and move forward. And that's why I don't. That's why I don't drive around fucking Ferraris anymore and all these things that that really become a pain in the ass with their payments, their insurance, and all these things. I've got a paid off Ford Bronco. And I've got a, a, um, a 250 motorcycle, and I'm loving life. I still get to the waves just fine, you know? How long did it take you, John, to learn forgiveness? Like, truly in your heart and soul that you could look at someone like Carrie Hart, who you had a rough relationship with, and just say, dude, I forgive you. Right. And I've never seen him face-to-face -face since then to say that, and I would love that opportunity, but... um I don't see us ever crossing paths again as I'm on a totally different path than he is. He's, he's still living high life with his wife and all that. And, um, but, but in my mind, it, it, it's over. I don't think about it. It doesn't bother me. The only time I think about him is when fucking knuckleheads like you bring him up in interviews. You know what I mean? He doesn't cross my mind. It, literally, it's a non-issue. So, you know, when I see a shirt's heart in Huntington, I just see my name. I don't even see his name. I don't, I don't look at it and go, oh, that mother. Yeah, I just don't, I just don't care, man. And it is a pretty free thing, you know, and, and, it's, and it's actually pretty awesome, you know. Well, you know what? If forgiveness is a big thing, and a lot of people, especially with the way society is today, have a lot of problem with that because everybody seems to be insulting everybody, whether it's on social well, everybody media. Everybody has their problems. I mean, Dave, everybody has. I mean, I still have a very sharp tongue. And that's one of the reasons why me and my ex aren't together anymore. And when I feel like I've been wrong or I've been attacked, I attack. And I have a very wide vocabulary, and I have the ability to use it quickly. And, and I say things that I don't really mean to say, that I don't really mean, but I just want to win. And, and you do stuff like that, and you're going to get your ass left, you know? And that's just the way that you got to... Well, something that people have to understand is that every action has a consequence. And... If you do not, if you do not 
think about that consequence before you make that action. That consequence is going to be in your face before you know it. And that's my big thing is that I don't forward think enough to think that I should not say this, so I'm not going to. I say it, and afterwards I go, oh, shit, I shouldn't have said that. You know what I mean? There we go. And in reality, I'd rather get cracked in the face than have bad words said to me from my girl because a punch goes away. Those words cut you like a knife forever. And if there's anything in my life I could change, it would be my sharp tongue. And I'm working on it. You know, I still go to therapy, and I work on it all the time. And, 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 but it's, it's, it's never-ending, you know? I mean, I, I was in therapy yesterday talking to my therapist about it, and I used it again today and insulted her. And it's just, it's just not cool. It's just not cool. And, and it's something I need to work on. And I know I need to work on it, and I will work on it, and I will get better at it, and, and, and you know? And it is what it is, you know? If you kind of get crazy when feelings are involved, especially when you love, you know, when you love, shit gets crazy. Thank you. And so there's a, I mean, God dang, I mean, there's a reason why cops don't want to enter domestic problems. You know what I mean? It's, man, there's nothing, no feeling like that. And it's, it's just when you love somebody, the amount of rage, like I said, you have to love somebody to hate them. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a crazy cycle, bro. It's a crazy cycle. Would you ever take a group of, say, younger guys that you look at and say, that was me 20, 30 years ago, would you ever grab a hold of them and just say, come with me, I'm going to mentor you on the right way to do things rather than blowing up? Because it sounds like you're at that point, John, where you feel you need to start passing what you have been able to learn learn internally onto someone else. Yeah, I mean, I would love that. I've actually done it a bunch of times. I've gone into to jails and spoken to kids, and, and I've gone into schools and spoken, and, and, and this was back when my TV show was on and stuff, and, and, um, and I felt really, um, I felt more accomplished by that stuff than by this other stuff I've done in business. It was pretty crazy, but, I mean, I, I, would, I would really love to get into motivational speaking. Um, I've actually got a, 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 a thing that I'm looking at right now in Fiji with, uh, with uh, Tony Robbins that I'm, I may go check out, and... Um, a possibility for, for something down there. And <clears throat> and I, I would really, really love to get on that motivational speaking circuit and go out and be able to tell people my story. And, and I mean, I'm still a ham. I love being on stage, and I love entertaining, and I love doing that kind of thing. I just wish I could do it and then turn off and no longer be John Huntington when I walk off the stage, kind of be able to put on a costume and not be bothered. And then when I walk on stage, I can take it off and do it. So there's, a, there's an internal battle with me there. But the, uh, the actual being a motivational speaker and helping people change their lives. I absolutely, I mean, I, I absolutely believe it. And my owners actually here see me do it all the time with my, with my uh, employees. I mean, I have a, I have, I have a kid in here that, that has a gnawing anger problem and, and I should have fired, I should have fired the kid. And instead I put him in, I put it in anger management and got in, and, and it changed them. And then I had another kid with another issue and, and six years old and, and, I had another one with another issue, and, and instead of firing them, I put them into, into different therapies and, and get them through these things, and when they show me they complete the therapy, they can keep their job. If they don't, they got to go. So I look at alternative ways to, to punish, or, or for, uh, I don't know if punish is the right word, to, to correct um, bad action um, from my employees, and, 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 um, and I'm, I'm hoping that that, that and, and like I said, when I was with, with my ex girl too, it was very important to me that we were always positive and in good light here in the in the restaurant and stuff like that too, to show them that you don't have to be in a bad relationship. You don't have to do that kind of thing. And so that kind of stuff is important to me. I try to lead by example. And um, you can either be a good example or you can be a bad example. And you can't be a hypocrite. You can't sit here and, and do one thing and then tell them to do another. You need to do what you what you say. You got to walk your talk. How much different was it for you to learn? Buddhist um, on this side of the water, then you go cross the Pacific Ocean to Thailand and learn what true Buddhism was really like. Yeah, I mean, wow. Wow. Um, wow. I read about it in the books, and I read about all the monasteries and the temples and all that stuff in the books, and, uh, and I had a, a, you know, my, um, a, a vision in my mind's eye. But when I landed in Thailand, my first time I went, was I mean shit? I was filming. I was actually I was um, hosting a TV show for Travel Channel over there. I don't know what I was doing. Something, but um, the, the, the show had wrapped, and I actually just said, you know what? Screw it. And I stayed. And I I stayed for another four weeks. And I flew in the girl I was dating at that time, who later became my wife. And um, we toured Thailand for like four weeks through all the different through all the different temples and stuff. And 
I literally sat in a room with a bunch of Buddhist monks with soaked robes and watched them go into chants and into meditation and watched them dry their robes. I mean, they raised their body temperature so high that the steam started coming off their robes and they dried their robes. When that shit happens in front of you, you have no... This isn't stuff written in a book that some dude did and he parted a Red Sea and there was a burning bush and blah, 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 blah. I'm not ripping on that book. But what I'm saying is that this is stuff happening right in front of your eyes. How do you not believe? How do you not? I have no, no idea. So, I, I've never been a Buddhist or followed the practice, so... But you don't, you don't even have to be a Buddhist to, have to, to, to realize that these monks can raise their body temperature so high that they can make their robes steam from wet and become dry how do you how do you physically do that they have that much control of their bodies in meditation that they can do that and i've seen it more than once that's amazing what's it like ste- it, it, what's it like it's ste- mind blowing i mean woo. what's it like stepping into a temple over there where buddhism is everything Well, I mean, I, I well, when I had my ranch in Escondido, when I was up there, when I had my ranch and and, and all that, and then there's the sister the sister temple to Plum City, which is fitting on Hans Place, is right down the road. I used to have I used to have all the monks come over and pick all the all my avocados and all my oranges and stuff to take them back to feed all the monks and stuff. So there are true Buddhist temples. There's true temples here as well. But just to be in the land, there's a certain air about being in Asia or in Thailand in. And you're not looking at American white-faced monks. You're looking at true Asian monks, like what you would think it would be. And it, it's it's a trip, man. It's a trip. You know, they all go out in their begging lines in the morning with their with their pails to get their food, and all the merchants come out and give them their food for the day. You know, they have no monetary acceptance. They don't cross money at all. They think it's all evil. So everything is either given to them or they make it. And... um and they have no physical attack. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And, and I actually told my, my ex that if her and I didn't work out, I was moving to Thailand and I was actually just going to be... It, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I literally, when I was sick, considered it. I considered not ever coming back out. I really, I mean, I really, really considered becoming a monk. And um, I just felt like I had... With, with the power that I had with the media and all that, I think I, I just felt like I had too much to do on the outside. And on that note, we're going to hop out for a break here at the bottom of the hour. Our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, John Huntington. You may remember his name from basically building the Las Vegas club scene, MMA, tattoos, the television show Inked, and so much more. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullet. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. Fairies? Bigfoot? Dogmen? Trolls? Goblins? Hey, if it's cryptid in any way, I'm looking into it. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, also known as Spaced Out Radio's Crypto Guru. Join me every second Wednesday of the month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, where we will talk about the stories people call tall tales. I will fill you in on the latest sightings and the hidden histories that are causing quite a stir. You can find everything at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Jolene with Rivulet Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet r or my Facebook page, Rivulet r and to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. It's time for you to make time for you. Would you like to expand your clientele? Have you ever thought of online radio advertising? Check out spacedoutradio.com to get your name out there. Our listeners support those who advertise with us, so why not give it a try? We have the most competitive advertising prices out there. 
Just click on the Advertising tab on spacedoutradio.com and contact us today. Are you an ET experiencer, but you just don't know what's going on? Are you too timid or shy to discuss it with anyone? Maybe I can help. Join me, R. Keith Andrews, the first Friday of every month on Spaced Out Radio, and I will help you to find the answers you're looking for. Together, I will help you understand the off-worlders and the true meanings behind your experiences. All you have to do is join us in the Spaced Out Radio chat room. See you there. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. Spacedoutradio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large, heard only on Spaced Out Weekend, at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being with us on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Tomorrow night on the show, we're getting back into the paranormal. S.J. Wells will join us. She's an author of The Paranormal. 30-year investigator. It's going to be a great show. It's 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern at spacedoutradio.com. Tomorrow, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While you're there, check out my latest blog. It's on the paranormal. Click on the blog tab. If you like our music, you may know Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses. He does all the music for this show as well. You can read the SOR Space Wire, get caught up on all the strange news around the world, and join the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only 5 bucks a month. The other guys just give you access to the archives, not us. You get a private section for posting on your website. You get your name put in monthly prize draws, the first one being two days from now, and a hell of a lot more than what the other guys are doing for you. We care about our listeners we want you to be a part of it as well tonight we are talking with john huntington he is a legendary party man of las vegas well not anymore he's living in hawaii along the beach enjoying life (laughs) and what we're talking about tonight is we're talking about how he gave it all away to find his inner zen john we bring you back thank you so much you're welcome brother you're welcome I got a few questions from the audience here. This one comes from Corrine, and she is asking, John, what is peace to you? We all want peace in our lives, and it comes from different forms. What is your peace source? Wow, well, that's that's a really good question. Um, my peace source is is the water. No matter how bad my day is, water cures all. And um, and like I said, I mean, I just went through a breakup. You know, me and my girl just broke up today, and. For good, and uh, first thing I did was I went and trained, and I went and I got in the water. And um, it doesn't seem, no matter how bad your life seems to get, um, it seems like the water makes it okay. And for me, that's just kind of my center and my zen and my kind of my happy place. And you know, here in Hawaii, that's why I've always lived where there's warm water and clean water, and because it's such a big part of my life. And and for me, it's um, my happy place is just being in the ocean for sure. 
And another question coming from Corrine. What do you think your purpose here on Earth is? Is that important to you to know that answer? Wow. Um, you know, I, I, back in the day when I, was, when I was young and dumb, I thought I was to throw parties. But um, like I said, I, I think I have a much higher calling. I think, I think that my, my job is to, is to pass on the teachings that I've learned, and, and that's why I'm now focusing um, with, my, with my teacher in, in, uh, in yoga, Saipan, and, and I'm moving towards being a yoga teacher and, uh, to where I can actually take an hour of somebody's time and help them erase their day and change their minds to a different place and take them on a, on a spiritual journey. And, um, and that, that's one of the things I'm going to miss the most about my ex going back to there is that she's such a great person that leads meditations. And she used to lead me through this craziest meditations that would, I would literally lose myself. And, and and that's going to be a big, a big miss. And, um, it's, it's crazy where you can go when you get out of your physical mind. And it, it, the body is a, it is all it is, is it's a vehicle and, and it's not really us. And, and it's just, you know, it's, you know, it, once you be, realize that you're just, you're an energy you, you realize that, that you have a higher calling and, and, and that, that calling is going to is far beyond going to the gym or, or doing things or making yourself look good or whatever and, and that I mean like I, I, every single person that walks in this restaurant I try and give them a smile and if they don't bring me one back I try to change it to that they do and that may seem like something small but if you give somebody a smile a day you've changed their day you've changed their lives for that day and that may be a little minuscule time of their day but it's still a time of their existence and take it from me, you never know how short life is until you face death. And I never thought, I was out on tour in Casper, Wyoming, and all of a sudden, I started throwing up. I was on stage, and I started throwing up, and I'm like, what is going on? The next morning, I woke up still throwing up, um, and the next day, I was in the hospital with kidneys, with failing kidneys, dying. And this is coming from playing in front of 3,000 people in Casper, Wyoming, getting paid five grand to sit there for an hour and a half to all of a sudden I'm in a hospital. And so just if you give them that smile, who knows if they're going to walk out of the restaurant and get hit by a car. I mean, God help them. I hope they don't. But it, it's, it's just something that I always try and do. I always try to show aloha. I try to totally live the aloha spirit. And, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's truly important. And... So I think that, uh, yeah, I think I have a higher calling. I think my job is to change lives, and I think my job is to change attitudes, and I think that, that, that I'm doing that day by day, and, um, and I'm trying to get, become a better person every day to be a better guide, and, um, you know, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, I'm, no, I'm not even remotely perfect or not even close to perfect, and um, it's a daily study, and it's a daily, it's a daily grind to be a good person, but it's... You can't sin on Saturday and be fucking forgiven on Sunday, man. You got to live a path, and if you and if you don't live that path, then you're you're a hypocrite. I'm sorry, but you can't you can't call me anything because I came from that side of religion, and so it, it just it's just the way I see it now. And you just have to you have to walk a, a good path every day, a path of empathetic thought every day. Corrine wants to know if she goes to Hawaii and she's in a very attractive lady. Can she get a date with you now that you're single? She's a very white lady. She's a very attractive lady. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she, she's one of my favorites around here, and, and she's also a, an award-winning poet as well, so she is extremely uh, I talented. love you some poetry. Please, please send me some poetry. Get, get my address from Dave. I would love, love to read your stuff. I love reading poetry. Oh, she's extremely talented, extremely talented. No, I would, I would, I would literally, I love that stuff. I love literature. When you started having your health problems, was it just the daily grind, or was it a combination of drugs and alcohol as well? No, I think a lot of people said that, and, and I actually went to the doctors about that and asked them, and and I mean, I, I'm not going to lie, I did my share of, of drugs, and, and I did my share of the cocaina and the, um, and the pills and everything else, and, and you know, I mean, it's what kept me going, it was my fuel, but um, it... Nah, man. The doctor thought it had it had a it had a non non effect. Um, so, um, I, I 
I, I can't say it didn't because every time you do that, it, it grinds on your body, you know. But I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't have an answer to that, Dave. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, all I know is I, I still have cocktails here and there. I don't drink a lot. Um, I uh, I don't do drugs, um, but um, except for uh, mushrooms here and there. I love mushrooms, but um, it's it's not. I, I think that there's. I think I just put it this way. I would rather put a line of cocaine in my body than a Big Mac. I can guarantee you that. I've never done cocaine. Oh, I've, well. So I'll take you to Studio Fifty Four. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wind it back a little bit. Oh, what the hell! You only live once, so why not go with it? Yeah. You mentioned that you're getting into yoga now. How has yoga helped you calm your own nerves as somebody who considers himself to be a real firecracker? It's, um, it's pretty incredible. It depends on the teacher, too, and where you are in your headspace. But, um, yeah, yoga has, is, is literally changing my life. It's unbelievable. Um, excuse me, I'm reaching in my cooler and pouring myself a shot of fireball. Um, yeah, the... Uh, Yoga has changed my life. Just, just the entire, the, the, the hour of checking out and, um, and, and checking in with yourself mm-hmm. is pretty incredible. And if you have the right teacher, the right guide, um, it can be pretty, pretty amazing. And, it's, and it's, it tends to be my hour of calm. And uh, literally the second time that I, that I went to, to the place where I, where I do yoga at, Yoga Hale, I... I, I met the woman who's played a massive role in my life for the last few months and, and um, was pretty spectacular. And like I said, I talked about it before Chantal, and, and it was pretty amazing. And, um, and I, I, our story is over, and the book is closed, and now I move on. And um, so who knows what will come next. Um, my girlfriend before that was a yoga instructor. My girlfriend before that was a yoga instructor and a reef model. Um, I tend to be, I don't know, I just tend to be drawn to these kind of women and I think that, and I think that's probably because when I go home, there's a balance there because I run at such a high energy and such a high frequency when I get home to have somebody who's kind of the opposite end of my spectrum that can bring me back down to life, back down to, to you know, being chill. Um, I think that being around another person of high energy would be crazy. And um, so I don't know. I don't really know what, what, I don't know what's what right now. Who knows? I'm, 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 like I said, my life has changed drastically today. So um, I don't have any answers really right now. What about meditation? As someone who is high strung as well, like I am, not as much as you, but I barely have five minutes in a day to myself, let alone to find half an hour a day to meditate. Do you try and meditate or where do you try to meditate? Um, well, I actually used to, I used to try and meditate up at my, up at my, uh, my ex-chick's house. She has a beautiful house up in the mountains. And, uh, like I, I guess I might as well just say it. A big place where I used to meditate and we're just going to go there was when we were having sex. And, and she used to lead me through meditations, when, literally while we were having sex and stuff. And it was, it was pretty crazy. And then she's going to kill me if she's listening. But, um, it's, um, it, it was, it was mind blowing. It, it, it's, Meditation is a really personal thing, and it's when you have a mind like mine that's constantly going, constantly analyzing, constantly looking for a new hole, constantly seeing, okay, well, you could redo this business that way, you could redo this, that, 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 blah, 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 blah. It's, it's very hard to tune out, and um, the one time that I tended to tune out was when I was with her, and I would just tune into her, and she was the only thing that I really paid attention to, so my business mind would go away, <clears throat> and I guess that would kind of be a form of meditation, so... Um, yeah, it's a tough subject. I'm not good at it. She was great at it, so I don't really have I don't have the answers to that one really. I mean, I, no, I that's the best I can do on that. Meditation is so tough, man, because if you're not in the right headspace or you're not with the right person, like I can't do it on my own. I can't just sit there and, you know, sit on my bed with my legs crossed, my hands out, trying to find my, my inner peace. I, it's yeah, imp- dude, it was nuts. She would wake up in the morning and the first thing she would do, I literally, I'd watch her, I'd get up to brush my teeth and she'd roll up and she'd go straight into meditation. I'm just like, yo, dude, how, like, out, I mean, out, out, gone. 
and I just sit there and just watch like whoa and she over her food and over she every time she eats she blesses her food and thanks the the the, the animal for giving their life for the, her to be nourished and just a true spiritual being and and like there's people that say they're a spiritual being like my girlfriend before that was a wolf in sheep's clothing just a fucking jackass but this chick is just on point and had it all together and just was really that person and and it was um it was it's it's mind blowing to see somebody who's really that spiritually connected you know she's an empath though and she's an indigo child and it's a whole different level it's a whole different level of of, of crazy <laughs> I guess did you find yourself as you started to learn your inner self and you started to find out more about meditation your inner chi and you mentioned that she was an indigo child did you find yourself all of a sudden researching all of these topics and names and and adjectives that people were calling themselves in order to try and understand where they were coming from Oh, God, you got to repeat that question, brother. I don't understand. One more time. Well, basically, you mentioned that your ex-girlfriend was an indigo child. As you right. became... You know what that is? Yes. And, okay. And as you became more spiritual, did you find yourself researching? Because I know when I started having my own experiences, I researched the living hell out of what was going on for me so I could try and understand. As you became more Buddhist and more trying to find your peace, did you find yourself doing a lot more research to figure out what you wanted to be and what you needed to learn? Okay. Um no. What I did was I just felt. I, I took myself from from where I was, and I trusted my guides, and I trusted what I was learning, and I trusted that the universe was going to take me on the path that I needed to be on, and um, and so far it's done me it's done me good. Um, I, I'm not a big researcher, um, although I did look up I did look up a lot of the on, the on the empath, and I did look up a lot on the indigo child with with my therapist when I was trying to understand how to be a better dude and 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 I get it no hold on let me see I read it I don't really get it I see it I don't really understand it I've lived it I don't really understand it um, it is but it has no definition it, it's just when you get to that level of spirituality and you get to that level of connectivity and you get that level of of Ability, it's mind blowing, and um, and and this person will blow my mind daily. And um, it, it, like I said, there's there's wolves in sheep clothing. There's these fake fake people out there, and, and then there's the real deal. And when you go from one to the other, it, it's wow. And so I don't know. I, I think that I was probably the probably the heaviest, and, and like I said, we were together a very short time, okay, like three months. And, and but it was the, probably the most spiritual thing and, and stuff that I've done. She's just gnarly, man. Just crazy, you know. And some of it was extremely uncomfortable for me. But it's it's. Um, am I sounding like a whiny little bitch? Like I miss her or something? No. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, no. no but it, it's. I, I I honestly don't think that we had ever worked. I don't think that it would ever work. Um, I, I think that I have a different path, and, and I think I know who that path has worked, but, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's... Now you sound in motorbike. Man, yeah, I know. I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the restaurant, and bikes are going by and shit. So, yeah, that, God, man, this, this, whole, this whole spirituality in, in, in Zen and shit, it's just kind of hard to define to words that people will understand that are just people that might be Catholic or something else to where I can take it across that realm, yeah? Did you ever find yourself, though, John, getting frustrated with yourself or the amount of information that it took in order to try and transform yourself? Because every day it's a work in progress, and every day you're learning something new. And if you're not learning, you get frustrated, or you're getting frustrated because there's too much information to try and change yourself, your persona, in order to find that inner peace. Do you still struggle with that? Yeah. You know what my biggest struggle is, is, is calming my ego. And coming from, you have to understand, and that to some people that might sound egotistical in itself, but, but it's, it's, 
it, it, coming from a place where you, where you never pay for anything, where you get rushed in in front of everybody, and I mean everybody, you're given anything you want. Um, it, it, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's the hardest. My, my biggest battle is being humble. And, and it's something that you really have to have learn and you have to really understand. And, and, and it's an embarrassing thing to talk about, but I've always been across the board. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I always said that if I was going to have a Facebook that was going to be about me, it's going to be about me. Yeah, I got locked up. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm going to eight mile you. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to tell you everything about me on the truth level. And I've got two, two DUIs. I've done cocaine. I've done the things. I've, you know? I fuck strippers. I fuck the hookers. I've done. I've done all that. So what? I am a man, and and but that, and that's the same thing. Like today, when when I put up my posts about about my ex and stuff, and and they want me to be this big old egotistical friggin' man and blah blah. He's like, no, nah, man, I'm hurting. Like that's not how I feel, you know. Like 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 we cried ourselves to sleep the other night, and and we went through it, and we just decided that we're not good together, and together we made that decision. And so it's, I just try to be the truth. Like, that's all I try to be. And if people don't like it, fuck, kick rocks. I don't care if you like it or not, but it's the truth, you know? I got a couple questions from Noel coming in here. And this one goes back to when we were talking about mentoring. Noel is asking, are you looking into mentoring in terms of helping someone from having a dream and a ment- and mentor them into returning, in return having the credit one way or another? Can you say that question? I don't understand. Yeah. Like having a dream and then having a credit? What? Well, basically helping, mentoring someone to help realize their dream. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. Right? And mentor them in return, have a credit one way or another with them as, I guess, a yeah, payback. I, see, mentoring, mentoring is, is a very tricky thing because some people mentor for ego and some people mentor because they truly just want to, like, get somebody better, you know? And, and for me, I don't, I don't care about the ego part. I don't want any part of that. I just truly want to put a smile on that person's face. And, and for me, my mentoring kind of goes more, more so in the, in the spiritual side and in the, in the, in the be a good man side. But the, the, um, you know, I mean, I've been, I've, I've been asked a lot of times to, to do like, like winter music conferences asked me probably 10 years in a row to come down and speak about producing parties and blah, 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 blah. And, and I just decline it every time. And, it just doesn't interest me to teach people how to get into that game. Um, now, if they came down and they asked me how to change your life, John, will you come down and teach people how to change their lives and see the truth and get away from them? Like the game where you're ruled by money and you're ruled by, by cars and by materialistic things? And yeah, you, I, would come, I would probably come, I'd probably pay to come speak at that one, you know? And, yeah, the, the mentoring thing, it's a really tricky thing because you got to really watch what you're doing. you got to really watch your mentoring. And, and, and as far as having somebody trying to help them reach their dream, people's dreams got to be realistic. That's the first thing you got to teach them in mentoring, you know? If you're dreaming that you want to be the president of the United States, you know what? I mean, what, how many have we had? 50? I mean, it, it's not really, it's not likely. So there's a lot of things that, that you got to kind of, wake people up to and um, I mean in reality a lot of the American dream is gone so um, yeah I, I don't so much mentor for dreams I say I probably more so mentor for reality and, and, if, and if they have something that they would like to be and it doesn't seem realistic then maybe maybe one of the mentoring things you do is you guide them to a new path that does make sense yeah absolutely and a second question from Noel He's saying, I always want, I was always told by my elders, when you eat angry, your food becomes unhealthy. When eating calm or happy, your food becomes nutritious. Do you believe, John, how the food is ingested makes a difference? Absolutely, 100%. Um, yeah, this is, this is something going back to, to my ex. Um, she was very, very serious about blessing her food and about about thanking the, the food for giving their life for us to be nourished. And I mean, like, no joke, like, very serious. And and that sets a mood or a tone to your body to then ingest the food. I think that if you shovel food into your mouth and you're, and you're just grinding and you're, and, you're, and you're just kind of going through the motions, kind of like I do a lot because I only eat for nutrition. I try to stay very lean and I train two to three hours a day and I just kind of put it in my body. 
Um, yeah, it probably doesn't become as nutritious as it would if you sat and, and, and truly enjoyed every bite and really enjoyed your food because it's telling your body that it's having an enjoyable experience. Well, I'm telling my body, get this shit down because I got work to do, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, I 100% believe that. I think that the attitude and the, and the, and the, um, and the energy that you bring your food into your body tells your energy how to accept that food and what to do with it. 100. And we got a question from Corrine here for you. So we only got about two, three minutes before we're going to go to break at the top of the hour. John, have you relieved your ego to any degree? We know as spiritual adepts that we must surrender essentially. Do you feel like you have done this? I'm trying. As I said before earlier in this break, it's a daily battle. Um, I'm trying, man. The, the ego is the hardest thing to break, yeah? Especially when you come from a place where I have. Um, I don't think that your listeners quite even know how big it was. Um, it was no joke big. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, Molly Cream was in the, in, the, in, in the lobby of the Mandalay Bay, and I was in the lobby of the Mandalay Bay, and the Mandalay Bay rushed to get me in, not Molly. And that, that's where it was. And it was, a, it was a whole different game. I mean, it was nuts at that time. And so, so it was... You come to where you expect it, and that's when shit gets dicey, and um, and that's where you have to kind of rethink what you're doing. And ego is a tough thing, and it's something, um, Corinne, that I battle with still daily. And it's uh, uh, fighting with being humble is a hard thing every single day. I have to learn to be humble every single day, and I have to think. I have to be. I have to literally be present and think about being humble every single day and then that's where everybody comes up to me and they or people come up to me and they say you know hey you're Huntington you're this you're that I'm like dude I'm just uh, I run a restaurant that's all I do and then probably 90% of the time if people ask me if, if he if I am he I, I say no if so um, I'm trying I, I, I'm trying I'm winning the battle I think finally and on that note, John, I'm going to get you to hold on. We're going to take a break here. Hour number two wraps up. Hour number three coming up right after this break with John Huntington. You may remember him from the Heart and Huntington and the television show Inked. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy. 
And I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Tonight, I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the show, we get back into the paranormal. S.J. Wells will join us. She's from Washington State, been investigating and writing about the paranormal for better part of 30 years. We'll get into that tomorrow night as we get back into the ghoulish ghosts at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time. <clears throat> Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. Find me on Instagram, Dave Scott S O R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, for our archives, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. While on our website, you can check out a multitude of features. Check out who we associate and affiliate ourselves with. You can also read any of our blogs that are written, including by yours truly on the paranormal this week. Check out the S O R Space Wire our news section of the Wacky and Weird, and of course, you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's just five bucks a month. You get your name entered into monthly draws, private sections on our website for you to post, and so much more. Unlike the other guys, we give you a hell of a lot more than just access to our archives. Everything can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Tonight, we are talking with John Huntington. He is a Vegas legend. And he may not like me saying that, but I will say that. This is a man who put Vegas and the party scene on the map. This is someone who helped establish Hart and Huntington Tattoos, which led to the A&E television show, Inked, which was the highest rated show at that time. John, welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, man. i got a few questions coming your way from the audience. Okay. This, this one comes from Kareen again. What have you found in life that is the most important things to be aware of? Wow. Um, well, for me, it depends. I mean, it, it's different person for person, yeah, but for me, it's my temper. I have to totally be aware of my body temperature. Um, a little bit of management, you learn that, that the first thing that changes in you is your body temperature. And um, so I, gotta, I always have to be aware of, of my body temperature. I have to be aware of, of my muscles tensing up because those are, those are triggers of your body telling you that you're about to be angry. And um, those are the triggers that, that immediately send me for a walk. Um, now, for other people, it might be something else. It might be, you know, anything. It, it, it might be uh, they, they feel that their, their throat tightening because they have asthma or whatever it may be. But, but as far as I'm concerned, I, my, biggest, my biggest struggle struggles are my ego and my anger. So... So I have to kind of watch those things very closely. I've got my anger 100% under control, 
not so much my tongue, but I don't throw hands anymore, or not as much unless the guy deserves it. But um, they, it's, 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 it, you know, you got to pay attention to your triggers, man. SJ is asking in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker tonight, have you ever thought, John, of practicing your change and healing with a Reiki master? It is necessary to heal mind, body, and spirit all at once. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know much about it. I haven't really studied it much. I'd be interested in it, and I'm actually going to start getting into that and looking into it. Um, I just started going into the, into the, the shaman realm <laughs> and healing medicines and stuff like that. Um, so it's something that I'm definitely looking into. It's not stuff that I've totally gotten into because I'm more into the traditional Buddhist and the, and the, and the traditional Zen Buddhist and, and that kind of thing. So, um, it, it's, it's something that definitely, definitely got my interest and it's something as soon as I get time between running two islands with Harley Davidson's and a 140 seat restaurant and everything else I do, it's something that I'm definitely going to look at, look at because it's, it's got my, it's definitely piqued my interest. I'll tell you, man, my wife is a Reiki master and mm. she is someone, I, I'm going to get her to give you some for free. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that because I'll tell you this. I never believed in it. And then one day I was going through a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. My depression was kicking up. And she says to me, she goes, okay, I want you to sit in this chair and I'm going to start way back here. And you tell me when you start feeling the pain. And she started about four and a half, five feet behind me. And she started moving her hands closer and closer ever so slowly. She got about 18 inches to two feet behind me, man. And I started screaming where I almost jumped off my chair. Yeah, dude, this stuff is nuts. It's nuts. I don't understand it. The problem is that there's a lot of fakes in it. Um, But it's, yeah, I mean, if this really happened to you, it's, yeah, it's beyond. I I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it either, but to this day now, all she has to do is put her hands on my knees or my feet, and I am out like a light within like 30 seconds to a minute. It's just the weirdest thing, man. I never thought I would agree with that. And I'm getting... Yeah, I'm, that's crazy. And I'm getting in hell for calling it Reiki. It's pronounced Reiki. I'm being told. I'm being scolded by my audience in the chat room. It's Reiki. 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 Oh, you know what? They keep That's me. Awesome. They keep me on my toes every night, man. They are so smart, and if I screw up, I got to admit to it. Good for you. Absolutely. Kareen wants to know if you've ever read Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. Ah, that was something that literally my freaking ex chick talked to me about last week. I have not read it, and um. I am more of a Fit Not Han guy. I read a lot of Fit Not Han, and um, and um, I have not got to that, and I need to get to it. Uh, send it to me. I'll read it. Also, she wants to know, how many people in the industry that you're in seem to be aware of what time it is? And when she says time, I'm assuming what life is like now compared to... Right keeping a paper bag over your head, so to speak. None. It's, it's unbelievable how much people just go through the motions. It's unbelievable how checked out people are and how... And one of the things that I do in my restaurant is I go up to the kids and ask them to put down their phones and communicate. Um, <clears throat> we have totally and completely lost society to the cellular computer. Everybody calls it a cellular phone. It's not a phone. It's a freaking computer now. When you pay $800, you think you're only buying a phone. That's not... You're buying what used to be the Mac computer. And so when you're paying $800, you're actually getting a cheap Mac. So understand that that people are now walking around with what we had back in the day, Dave, in their pocket. Okay? Everything that we used to do, you can do Word, you can do Excel, you can do PowerPoint, you can do emailing, you can do Facebook, you can do friggin', you can do whatever, Snapchat, you can do Instagram. All of this on a little thing in your pocket. Now... The problem is, is that when I stand over my restaurant, sometimes I sit out here and I look, and 90% of the restaurant is looking in their phone. Uh, and and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say that I don't, but the thing is, is that it's unbelievable how checked out society is. And if they do check in, they check in to take a fucking picture of what's going on. I mean, if you take a picture with your mind, it's there forever. 
You'll never forget that. And and it's yeah, it, that that is a, that that's a big that's a big deal with me right now. I'm I'm kind of the, the the biggest thing that I did that I loved when I left for Thailand was that I threw my phone in the trash. And for almost two years, a year and a half, I didn't have a telephone at all, no cell phone, no contact. When I left, I left, and when I came back, that's when you could speak to me. And it was such a free, beautiful, beautiful thing. When I started going back to driving boats again, I, of course, had to have a phone on me so I could call 911 in case something went wrong. I went down there, it's not 911, but I call emergency services. So it changed. But as, of like, as we speak right now, I can guarantee you, for those that aren't asleep, that those are up. 50% of the people that are up right now in America are looking at their phone or their computer. How checked in are we? I don't think we're much checked in at all anymore. I think we're pretty much checked out. And I think that right now all we are are people that are taking in what media is feeding us. And none of it's the truth. The news isn't the truth. None of it's the truth. It's whatever the government or whatever the companies that are out there want to feed us is getting shot into our minds but making it look like it's the truth. And it's scary at best. Would you say that we have numbed down society and the ignorance of it is really taken over with the way people act. Like you said, they come to the restaurant and 80, 90% of them have their faces buried in their cell phone rather than communicating with one another or looking at someone else or something along that line. You know, something else that I've noticed a lot about Dave is that manners is uh, it's un friggin' believable. Men don't pull out chairs for women anymore. They don't know how to hold a fork and knife. Do you know how many people don't know how to hold their cutlery, the cutlery proper? And it's unbelievable to me what has happened to society and that, and that type of thing. Just basic manners, basic, basic etiquette has gone out the window. And um, it blows me away. I mean, I can tell you this. If we go on a first date and you don't know how to friggin' hold a steak, uh, steak knife and a fork, you're cut. I'm not going out with you again. I don't, I, I, there's nothing that repulses me more than somebody carving into a steak like it's a board with a saw. Um, Maybe that's because I'm a restaurateur, I don't know, but etiquette means a lot to me. The woman walks in the door first, surely is not dead, you take out the chair, you open the door of the car, you, you know, kindness and empathy and, and, man, I, yeah. I'm really bothered by a lot of it, and I check a lot of people about it, and, and I'm really good with the women that I date, or that I've dated um, with that, and it's just something that needs to be looked at, and it's something that, the funny part is, is that a majority of women now don't even know what it is. The fact that you open the door, they don't even get it, that it's such a, that it's such a um, empowering thing that your man came, and, and um, maybe empowering isn't the right word, but such a... I mean, yeah, maybe it is the word. It's a fucking empowering thing that I'm, that your man thought enough of you to come around the car and open your door. It's, yeah, man, it's shady at best right now. Well, it's chivalry, too. That's it, it's chivalry. I mean, my five-foot-nothing mother would come up and pull my six-foot ass down by my ear, even at 80 years old right now, if I didn't open the door for a woman I'm dating. She just would. And, and... It's just, uh, yeah, man, I trip out on the way on the way things are now. I don't know. Do you ever get tired, John, of people wanting the old John Huntington so when you do get recognized, they're like, hey, tell me some stories about back in the day. And and you've tried to move on but with that, but you notice everybody tries to continually to suck you back in. Yeah, that, that's a con- constant, constant thing. And especially on Facebook or something like that, we'll post, Damien and I will post an old po- uh, picture or something, and and um, and everybody will say, come on, time for a comeback, time to come back and do this, time to come back and do that, blah, 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 blah. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's trying. I'm just. I'm not the same dude. I just don't care. I don't want to put in that kind of effort. I don't want to have that kind of exposure financially um, to draw a party. I mean, people don't quite understand. They thought we just showed up and made stupid money. It's not that way. We put months and months and months into a party to make it happen on that one night. And it's um, yeah, it's trying. It's very trying. I was talking to a buddy of mine in Vegas who's involved in the rock and roll scene, and Vegas for rock and roll has really taken off over the last couple of years. 
And one of the things that he said to me was that a lot of musicians, especially rock stars, are given a lot of information by the people they meet, whether they are, um, you know, politicians or just people in the know. They always want to talk about something, whether it's political, whether it's something that isn't discussed very much, you know, that's going on behind the scenes. Did you find a lot of people, John, giving you information that you just scratch your head, much like you did when I brought up the alien at my window? Did you ever get... Yeah, I, this is what I find. I find that a lot of people want to talk to me just to talk to me. Um, yeah, we said that. Of course, I. Um, um, yeah, a lot of people talk to me just to talk to me, and, they, and the thing that they try to do though is that they try to talk to me in a subject that they're that they're astute in. And the reason being is because they're afraid that I'll be more astute than them, and I'll make them look stupid. So they want to be the person that's kind of leading the the the, the subject matter. Um, I deal with that a lot. I deal with a lot of people that want to like they, that want to kind of question my knowledge when it comes to production they'll ask me about lighting and all these different things and um i think it's again it goes back to ego and it is what it is and it's something that you got to kind of deal with but it's uh, i don't know Dave. it is fame is a peculiar fucking thing it's a really peculiar thing and it's something that i literally wouldn't wish on my worst enemy but i would give to my best friend so on the good nights, it's awesome. On the bad nights, I'd rather stick a knife in my neck. How many times did you find yourself crashing? How did I find myself what? Crashing. Crashing? Yeah, just couldn't handle it. You know, maybe a few sleepless nights in a row, or maybe just the no. Dr- drama. That's, no, 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 no. That, no. The show must go on, man. No, that, that's not how it works. You don't have that option. Like when you become a celebrity, when you become on stage, people pay to see you. Like you don't have that option. You don't crash. You, you can't. You can't be Axl Rose like that. That shit. No, no. The show must go on. That's not an option. Shar is asking in the Space Out Radio chat room about tattooing. She is asking, do you think the constant tattooing can be almost in a sickness, like an addiction, and people are trying to hide by putting art on their body to cover up? This is what I think. I think it's a great question, by the way. Um, this is what I think. I think that tattooing is a, new, is a new boob job. I think it's a new ass job. I think it's a new tummy tuck. I think it's a new nose job. I think that tattooing is the way now to redesign your body in a cool fashion, and you can make it look any way you want if you follow the right lines. And um, and so I think that that I think tattooing is all encompassing and all of that. I think that I think that tattooing is now the new game. And um, I think kids, I, I think kids, great, sure, whatever. Um, do I care for them? Yeah, whatever. Um, but a woman with smartly placed tattoos. Oh, my, my. You know? Um, I have this friend, Shauna, that is just, she has these, these tattoos that are just placed perfectly across her, her upper ass and down her leg, and she has one sleeve done, and it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's, it's so unbelievably placed and so unbelievably done and so feminine and with flowers and just beautiful and butterflies and... When women are dresses and they look like that, like that, yeah, I don't know, man. It, it's like a, a an online game that you that you can play at the same time and go but try. I feel and like ca- people are getting hurt and shit. Like, what, what, I, I don't understand. I know. That's because they're too busy staring at their phones rather than paying attention to where they're walking in traffic. Oh, so they're out going on their phones, following pokies, like whatever they call pokies, and then they they freaking fall off cliffs and shit. Exactly. Oh my God! Are you kidding me? I'm dead serious. Wake up, America! What the fuck? Are you kidding me? Okay. Anyway, so back to the question. What was the question? Oh my God. Well, do you think that tattoos are a long-term fad? This is what I think about tattoos. If you try to remove them, you're screwed. So, if you're going to get a tattoo, just plan on being tattooed. Um, tattooing is a commitment. That's the issue, is that if you're going to truly be like me, if you're going to have uh, maybe 90% of your body tattooed, then, you know, I'm probably not 90, I'm probably 50, but 
you get tattooed. It is what it is. That's why when people are going, oh, you know, we do your neck again. Aren't you crazy? Aren't you afraid you're going to... I'm tattooed. It is what it is. So there's jobs that I'm not going to get because I'm tattooed, and there's jobs that just aren't going to care. So it's, it's, it's a commitment to be a tattooed person, but you're going to have to understand you're going to lose some shit. I mean, but as far as men, chicks need tattoos, so you're going to get a lot of chicks. So that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Bob wants to know, what about people who go the extreme when it comes to tattoos, like tattooing their genitals or their eyeballs. I mean, to tell you the truth, I don't give a shit if you tattoo your dick. That, that's up to you, but whatever. But, um, I mean, I've, I've seen some girls with tattooed vaginas and stuff like that, and I don't know, some are kind of hot. I saw one with that was like a perfect flower, and it, uh, yeah, anyways, <laughs> maybe that's up to your imagination. But, and I mean a beautiful, like, super orange, like, hibiscus flower. But anyway, so... But, I mean, tattooing your eyeballs, I mean, really, you want to fuck with your vision? You need a tattoo, what, your face? I, I mean, stuff that, 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 that is okay, but there's stuff when, you, when you're messing with one of your five senses, like, it's probably not so smart. It's just not something I'd do. They are addicting, though, the tattoos in general. Because, Char- I mean, I can tell you this. Okay, I, yeah, I, I, left a, I left a piece of my under right arm open for, uh, for my tattoo artist, Tim Avery. I promised her I'd keep it for her, and I did. And she just did it the, probably, I don't know, six months ago. Um, a, ca- a big captain's wheel with um, Always Wandering, Never Lost on it. It was a captain's tattoo I've always wanted, and she finished it. And I swore to her I would never get tattooed again. I will never get tattooed again. As you get older, it gets worse. And um, literally a month later, I was going to study my neck. And I've done seven hours in my neck since then. So... Yeah, it's yeah, it's a sick heroin for screwed up people like us. And you know what? They are addicting. You know? No, like, yeah. No, they are, man. Like I, I did one. I swear, I thought it was going to be my only one. I did a big Cadillac with the flames. I know it's kind of fucking stupid, but it's me and my father used to build old caddies, and that was the one that I put in the Kid Rock video with the ball, with the doll, ball. But um, so it was, it was symbolic, but. And then I see, you know, then my left arm's done, and then my right arm's done, and, and then everything has to look symmetrical, and then, and then, I mean, it didn't help that I went to tattoo shops, and in tattoo shops, when you get bored, it's not like going to the bar where you drink, in tattoo shops, when you get bored, you get tattooed, and so, it didn't help that I had a, a tattoo shop that was only closed two hours a day, you know? I never knew that that was your Cadillac in the Kid Rock Bar to Bosch video. Yeah, that was, that was my old 69 Fleetwood four-door special, yeah, and it's actually, it's in the museum in Dubai now. Wow. As a Kid Rock fan, I, I got to admit, I, that's one of my, probably my favorite song by him. I mean, if you can't get it Bob up. Bob Ritchie. Bob Ritchie. Um, yeah, I know him way before he was Kid Rock. He's a really, really cool mofo, you know? Kid's a, he's a southern gentleman. Do a lot of these guys, like Kid Rock or Chuck or whoever, do they still stay in touch with you just to check in? Or... You know, I, you know, I've kind of lost touch with it. It's kind of surprising. You know, I haven't talked to many in a long time. I talked to Tommy Lee the other day. Um, him and I kind of stay in touch. Um, but we, we all have such busy lives. If we're not immediately in each other's lives, we kind of just kind of move on to our new team, and that's that. We'll see each other in passing, and we'll be like, yo, you know what I mean? We'll talk about old times. But I get to understand that that's like, that's like being, being a best friend with a jet setter. I mean, you know that. You know that it is what it is. My two best friends, Aaron and Clint, they know that they'll see me when they see me. And I mean, these are guys that have been my best friends for 30 years, you know? And they'll see me when they see me. I haven't seen Clint since, or Aaron since Thanksgiving of last year. But I'll fly back home and we'll pick it up exactly from there. It's just the way it is if you want to be my friend. I'm going to be on the road. You know? Noel has a question here, and we only got about two minutes before we got to go to our final break of the night. John, do you believe the next rehab would be addicted to text messaging and games on our phones? I see too many accidents walking, driving, and causes antisocial in the physical world, yet extroverted the virtual world of texting. Yeah. Okay, this, this, is, a, uh, this is a huge freaking problem. Okay, I mean... I, was drive, I, I used to drive a, a Quattro Forte Maserati. For, it's, it's a two hundred thousand dollar car, lower down twenty twos, and, and um, I was texting one time, and I friggin' smashed into the back of a Ford F two fifty with a tow bar on the back, and it literally put me into 
probably about seventy-five thousand dollars worth of damage in my car, and of course that just lowers the car's level. It, it, was, it was because I was texting while I was driving. It's just not cool, and, and, and I can tell you this right now. Yeah, it's a new addiction, and yeah, it's going to be a problem. And yeah, like I said, I mean, people do not even know how to communicate anymore. It's unbelievable. You meet a girl and you start texting her. Let's say, let's say, I don't know, fucking whatever. You meet a girl on Tinder. You start texting her there. Then you give her your phone number. Then you start texting her there. By the time you get to where you're going to meet them, you're going to fly and meet them or whatever. Well, because I'm in, I'm in Hawaii or you know, whatever it may be. Um, you still haven't even had a conversation with them. You know what their, their voice sounds like? It's, um, I mean, is that, is that fucker stuttering? Like, it, it's mind-blowing to me. Pick up the phone, make a damn call. Call your mother, don't text her. And, yeah, 100% that's a new addiction. It's, um, and the funny thing is, is that me and Carrie, Carrie, Carrie Hart and I used to be sponsored by T-Mobile. T-Mobile was the first one that came out with texting. When we were, when we started Hart and Huntington was when the sidekick first came out. And that was when the very texting just began. And Carrie used to tell me how much she loved it because when him and Alicia, i.e. everybody else that was a pink, would fight, they would go to texting because they would get too tired of fucking fighting back and forth with their fingers that they would just quit the fight. But now everybody's gotten so fast and these things have gotten so fast that it, it worsens the fight. The biggest fight I've had with my ex is because we were texting and we didn't pick up the phone and go, hey, baby, I love you. What is it that you mean by that? People need to have more people contact and people need to have more human contact and people need to remember to touch each other and, and, and enjoy that sense of, of love. And, and, ah, man, these cell phones these days. Probably the happiest days of my life in the last 10 years was a year and a half I didn't have a cell phone when I was in Thailand. I didn't wear shoes one day that year and a half. I walked barefoot everywhere. It was blissful. It was blissful. And on that note, we're going to step out here for our final break of the night. John Huntington is our guest all the way from Hawaii. His new home gave Vegas up a number of years ago to try and find his own spiritual zen. We'll find out more right after this. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back. Are you an experiencer? Have you had run-ins with strange creatures you can't explain? ETs, Dogman, Bigfoot, Werewolves? They're enough to scare the daylights out of anyone. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski from your Four Cop. And on the last Monday of every month, you can listen to me and the host, Dave Scott, talk about the weird and the strange being reported on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to bring my investigations and sources, you bring your experiences, and we'll figure out the rest together. Strange Days on Spaced Out Radio. Come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From the radio, commercials, to banners, to social media. Have a product you'd like our host to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Right here, this is where we divulge the fruit of our research. Here on the Webster Phenomena every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern on Space Out Radio. Attention, Spaced Out Radio listeners. For only $5 a month, you can join Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers. Your membership at spacedoutradio.com will give you access to private fan area on the website, get you a monthly newsletter, draws for monthly swag, and a whole lot more. Sign up today to become a part of the Spaced Out Radio experience. Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. 
from Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Missed most of tonight's show? Don't worry, you didn't miss a thing. You can head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and download our archives for free. And don't forget to get your Space Travelers membership today. Now, back to tonight's show. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you so much for joining us. We're getting right back into the paranormal tomorrow night. S.J. Wells is our guest. She's got 30 years experience and she's written a few books about the subject. So we're talking ghosts, ghouls, and goblins tomorrow night on the mighty SOR starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. Remember, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like. Spaced Out Radio Show on Instagram. Instagram, Dave Scott, SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, for our archives. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While you're there, what I would love it if you did it is you can check everything out. From our Bumblefoot page, former guitar god of Guns N' Roses, Ron Bumblefoot Thal does all the music for this show. You can read the SOR Space Wire by our news director, Eric Markham. And you can join... The SOR Space Travelers Club. It only costs five bucks a month. That's less than a Starbucks coffee. You get your name put into private draws for prizes. You also get a private section for posting on our website and so much more. That all can be found at spacedoutradio.com. For the final time tonight, we introduce John Huntington from Hart and Huntington yeah, Tattoos. We appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this, John. I, I really appreciate that you put the trust and faith in me to do your first interview in about five years. Thanks so much. Well, you want to hear the funniest part? Was that when you sold me to do this, I thought you were talking about four, uh, like six four-minute breaks on the hour. It's not, not six 26-minute breaks with four-minute breaks in between. <laughs> well, you're a trooper, and I apologize for that miscommunication. But No, man, it's awesome. I'm glad I got more time to, to talk game. It's great. I'm stoked. Thank you. No, thank you from bottom of my heart and for my listeners as well. i got to ask you this, though. Why the hell are you so afraid of Bigfoot? Okay, look at Um, okay. <laughs> oh, man. we got to go there. Okay. This is real to me. When I was little, I used to always go camp, camp, camp out at uh, Lake Huntington, funny enough, right, with my father and all of his friends. And it's way up in the Sierra Nevada, so that's Bigfoot country. And um, my father was a Bigfoot follower and all that, so I used to have to watch all the shows with him and stuff. And I was too young to really understand. And my father's friend had a fake eye. He had a glass eye. So we used to all go camping, and they go out. Of course, my father was probably like our age, Dave, at this time. I mean, probably, even, probably even like less. He was probably like 35 or something. Like, what the hell would we do with our kids at 35 if they were five or six years old? We'd fucking mess with them. So he'd go out and crunch through the bushes and all this stuff, and he'd go down and put my, 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 my dad's friend's fake eye into the, into the rock so we'd find it and just basically haunt us to death. Well, that started it. And then that's when also all the King Kong movies kicked off. So I started having all these haunting dreams about King Kong and he'd chase me and I'd hide under cars and blah, 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 blah. Well, okay, so 
So since that time, to all the way through all of my life, I've, I've literally seen every single Bigfoot thing ever done. I mean, every there's not one thing that's ever been done that I haven't seen. Then one night, back in the day, probably 15 years ago, I'm hauling horses up to Oregon for a horse show. I used to invest in horses for a living. That's what I did. And I was hauling, and I swear on my mother's life, in the trees, I was hauling down a, a lonely road. At nine feet high, there was two red eyes that were blinking at me off the side of the road. And I, I slowed down enough and put down the window that I could smell the stench, and I know for a fact it was a Bigfoot. I can't, I, I never saw the body. I just saw red eyes and I smelled this gnarly ass, shitty ass stench. And it was, um, it was life, life changing. And, um, I don't know. I've just always been afraid. And I'm not talking about funny haha afraid. I'm talking about waking up with sweaty ass clothes in the middle of the night three times afraid if I'm having an episode where I've seen something about Bigfoot and it, it hasn't been a joke in my life guys like you and your cousin and everybody else thinks it's funny haha to me it's real and it, it's, it's like no joke man I had a Bigfoot experience with two Bigfoot back in September of 2013 man and it's pretty humbling when you see the size of these I didn't get the smell the first one was no, that's, not what I, that, that's what I'm saying these eyes were at 9 feet Oh, okay, yeah. I was driving a Tuli, an, uh, I was driving an F four fifty Tuli, pulling a nine horse, and this thing shrunk me like I was a bitch. Oh yeah, uh, that's a big ass rig. That's a semi rig, and this thing was uh, yeah. Oh man, come on, don't do that. I I fully agree, man. The first one that I saw, that a friend of mine and I saw, we came across this tree that was snapped at about eight feet high. All the trees around it. Exactly, exactly. And it was fresh. And all of a sudden we had this feeling that we were being watched. And sure enough, we looked straight ahead. About 100 feet ahead of us, there's this tree. And in the shadows underneath this tree, there's this face and this shoulder okay. staring back at us. Right. And to your listeners that don't understand, when you're being watched, there is a feeling of being watched. Trust yes. me, there is a feeling, a creep that goes up your back that is mind-boggling. And that's exactly what I felt before I pulled the truck over the side of the road. And and I'm telling you, it's this feeling. And I had the same thing when I was haunted by a ghost. Day when I used to, I'll tell you that story too, I used to run the Roxbury. Remember, everybody remembers the night at the Roxbury um, movie. Well, I was a general manager of that club. And we'll go back to that. So let, let's go on with Bigfoot and then come back to that, Dave. Okay. The second one that I saw, after we watched this guy for about five minutes, we're turning to go back down the path. Wait, you sat there for five minutes? Oh, yeah. We sat there for about five minutes watching this thing to confirm it, right? And then all of a sudden, as we're turning, I see at about 85 feet. So if you're looking straight high noon at the guy behind, or the Sasquatch behind the tree, go to about 1 o'clock, 1.30. There's this tree branch shaking vigorously. And that's where I got the full side profile view of this brownish red creature from the waist on up. I saw the pointed head. I saw the slanted to the face. And this thing was probably eight feet tall. I'm going to estimate between 350, 450 pounds. And it just walked right through where that branch was shaking, man. Like it was nothing. It didn't even look at us. Nothing. It's kind of like, I know you're there. I ain't going to mess with you, but it's time to leave. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you, uh, you just feel this air um, of their strength. And, uh, dude, it, it's just fucking creepy, man. Like, it's not cool. It's not cool at all. Like, people that are, that are out there right now, like, well, however many people are listening to you, it, they, they think that it's funny. It, it is not cool. Like, it's just not cool. These things are, like, so big and so strong. They're snapping off trees. Okay, yeah. we have to use chainsaws. They're snapping them off. What would they do to us? It's in, and they stink. Ugh, I don't know. They're horrible. I just think it's funny that that's the reason why you have never came, come to British Columbia to check out Vancouver or anything else because you're no, That's not true. I came to British Columbia one time. I went up there to look at the, um, the plaza of the nations. Is that what it's called? Because we're going to do Pimp and Hell up there. Is that what it's called on the water there? Uh, 
What's that big glass building on the water? Yeah, oh, what's it called? Um, it, it was built during yeah, Expo. Is the Americas or something? Yeah. I don't remember that. I've looked at so many spaces, I have no idea. But I came up there. Great sushi, hot chicks, awesome strip bars, Bigfoot. Bigfoot cancels out awesome strip bars, great chicks, good sushi. Just so you know, oh, yeah. when the Olympics rolled through Vancouver, all the strip clubs closed. God bless them. Okay, so that's because they're all hooking. So listen, the, um, yeah, like I had a friend that lived with me for a little while in Costa Rica, uh, in Costa Rica, and he told me about him surfing in Torfino and seeing them on the beach fucking digging for clams, dude. Yeah. Like, come on, man. Like, that, no, 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 yeah, no, no. I'm not going to. I'm not going to Vancouver. I'm not going to Canada. I'm not going where there's Bigfoot. If I'm in Hawaii. There's no Bigfoot here. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, but I literally, I, I had a job offer in Bali, Indonesia. There's a form of Bigfoot there, and I didn't take it because of this. Yet, I swear to God, I swear on my mom. Yet you recently posted okay. on your Facebook that you would go surfing with great white sharks and crocodiles. Yet you won't. Oh no, no, no. Oh no, no no! I said I'd surf with a shark before a crocodile. Okay. I, I've been chased. I've been chased out of the water three times by crocodiles. I would. I would rather surf with a shark than a crocodile any day. See, and I won't go in the ocean, man, because I'm a meal. I'm. I am not a. I am not okay. a. You know, I'm a meal. I am not a, a an appetizer. I'm not a you know a snack. And. I know for a fact, man, that the minute I step into the ocean, even if I'm ankle deep, I hear that da 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 Yeah, okay, look, at, but check this out. I'd rather have something with razor-sharp teeth go through me than something that's just going to rip my arm off and fucking use that as a club. Against me, probably. It's probably going to beat my ass with my own arm. Yeah, no, dude, I'm cool. I'm going to go in the ocean. I'm cool. I'm like, no. No, they're big monkeys. I don't, no. Little monkeys cause enough damage. I don't want a big monkey. Sharon wants to say to you in the Space Out Radio chat room that Hawaii <laughs> Hawaii is very big on alien sightings. Thanks, Sharon. Great. <laughs> what? Oh, man. Come on, guys. Like, I, yeah. No, the, the, I just actually just got a text from my landlord because I, I love the, the space. The, the space station flies over here all the time, and I love watching it. I can literally yeah. lay out on my beach. I'm a, I can lay out on my private beach. So tomorrow morning, spot the space station at 4:58 a.m. Visible for six minutes, maximum height 79 degrees. Appears northwest, disappears southeast. So I can literally track this thing every day. Like I, I watch it come across. Yeah, we do that too up here. On if you go to the NASA app, they have the times that if you punch, punch in your postal code. It will uh, point that. But up here, I actually got to, because like I'm right dead center of British Columbia, about five and a half hours north of Vancouver. And I actually, for the first time, I got a really good view where I was at a friend's house, and I was actually surrounded by the northern lights, man. Like, all of a sudden, they just surrounded us in the sky, and we had this whole sky show of the lights flickering. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Dude, that's hot. Like, I, that's one of the things I've never seen. What are they called? The, the base... The, what is it? The Aurora Aurora Borealis. Borealis. Yeah, man. I did. Um, hey, tell me about yeah, that yeah. ghost story. Um, um, it's... It, <sighs> So uh, I used to run. I used to run a um, a nightclub called the Roxbury, and the Roxbury was a place that was notorious for 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 celebrities and everything else. And it was pretty amazing. And um, there there was a girl. We used to have a VIP room, and a girl came in there and um, in a private party. She died of an aneurysm. Well, for some reason, this 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 girl after she died attached herself to me, and. I, I used to remember her name. I don't remember anymore. And I used to remember her drink. I think it was a vodka soda twist of lemon. And I used to put a, one of her drinks at the end of the bar every time, every every single shift. And um, it was it, it was mind blowing the things I felt from this woman. And the the, the we, there was a show called The Paranormal Experience or something that wanted to come in and film us and, and all about it. But the Roxbury people didn't want it to happen because. Because um, they didn't want um, us to get bad publicity and nobody would come. But this thing, it was no joke. Like, I would walk by faucets and it would turn on. It would turn on. 
um, I would be sitting there because at the night, at night, I'd be selling the books, and everybody would be gone. I wouldn't have a security guard with me, and that's when she'd start fucking with me. And one night, I actually met a girl, and the girl hung around while I was doing that, and I took her up to the dance room, and and we we're like hanging out, making out up in the dance room, and she literally turned on all the dance lights, and as all the lights started swirling. Um, another night, I looked up. There's a there's a big porta cachere. I mean, a big a rotunda with the with stairways up top. I looked up top, and of course, as cliche as this is, there's a there's a girl up there with a big white dress. Look up there. I told security, go up and get this girl out of there. She's not supposed to be up there. There was nobody there. It was um, it was real. And every time I walked in, I had this chill up my back, and it was just gnarly. And um, but she was cool, you know. And the funny thing is, is that now, um, Chantel, who who like I said that I was with before, they live in a house that two people have died in. And um, and the first thing I did, I, I walked up there and. I walked down these stairs, and there was two paintings that this lady had did, and for some reason, it was my first time down there, I, I don't even know why, I had to turn to them. And I turned to them, and immediately my, my face started filling with tears, and I started crying, and, and, and Chantel looked at me, and she was like, what, what's going on with you? I go, there's somebody here. There's somebody still here. And she's, as I told you before, is very connected and very on it, and she... She said that she was like, "Yeah, there is. I'm, I, I know. I, I feel them, and, and I feel her, and and it was very moving and very powerful. And for some reason, I have the ability to not be scared in that realm. And yet, Bigfoot scares the shit out of me. But I don't know. Like, there's this thing of of, of honoring the spirits and honoring this the, these these people that have passed that." I, I don't have words to explain it, but it's just mind blowing. It, it's it's awesome. But yeah, it, it went down in the Roxbury for almost two years, and she uh, they finally she finally left when they tore down the building, and uh, it was quite an experience, quite a, quite a crazy experience. Did she ever come home with you? Did she ever haunt you when you were driving in your car? Did you ever hear her voice or anything like that? No, no, no. She never left the building. She'd always greet me at the door. And the strange thing is she always knew when I was coming in. Like, I come in at different times. I didn't have a set hour. And she was always right there at the door because as soon as I walked in, my shirt would lift and she would then it would be a cold air around me. It was very weird. It was very, very weird. Question from Mike coming in in the SOR Space Travelers Club on Facebook. Besides Bigfoot, what is the weirdest thing, John, that you have ever seen? Okay, I'm going to tell you a great story. And, and you guys aren't really going to understand the story because you really don't know what it's like to be stranded in Baja, Mexico. But this is a great story. Okay, back in the day, when I used to have a shit ton of money, more money than I knew what to do with, I used to tow my, my $500,000 boat down to Cabo every year out of, out, of, out of Huntington Beach, where I'm from. So I had my F-250 and my 45-foot Scarab center console fishing boat with three 250s on the back. And I'd tow it through, through Cabo. And this isn't going to be weird, like when you think weird, but I'm telling you, this is some weird shit. So I towed it down, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Well, when I came back out, I wasn't under tow, so then about six months later, I went back down to get my boat. Well, I'd forgotten about the gas. And in between Puerto, um, Puerto Guerrero or Puerto Negro and this other spot, it's a long gap. Okay, well, when you're not under tow, you can make the gap. Well, when you're under tow, you can't make the gap. And there's a dude sitting there hand-cranking diesel fuel into fuckers like me that can't make the gap. Well, so I had to get hand-cranked fuel into my boat, into my truck. I got it up to this place called Catavina. And I parked in Catavina. Now, you understand, with my truck and my rig, I'm sitting at, a, at probably a half a million dollars in the middle of Baja, Mexico, alone with my, with my chocolate Labrador Jackson. So I go out in the morning. This is at sunrise. We're talking 5.30 in the morning. I go out to try and start my truck. Well, I'm married at this time. Burr, the thing won't start. It's a diesel F-250. The thing should always start. I call my wife. And my wife starts rolling a, um, they were in the towing industry. They start rolling a tow truck out of La Paz, which if anybody knows Baja very well, it's about 600 miles on that Baja road. And I started rolling a tow truck to the border. So when La Paz got to Catavina and rolled me up to the border, which is about 300 miles, then they would take me over and pull me across the border. So I'm sitting there trying to start my truck, start my truck, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, I swear to God, like a Clint Eastwood moving, out of the mist, this old man with a sombrero comes rolling out on a burro. I mean, I, I mean, a straight donkey, jackass donkey. This cat walks up to my truck, 
And he's all, ¿qué pasó? I said, I, I speak Spanish fluently because of my living in Costa Rica and Mexico and stuff. And I started speaking with him. And, and I told him that my, that my truck wouldn't start. And so he asked me for a screwdriver. He goes in, he tears apart my turbocharger, okay? We're talking about a $50,000 truck. And takes out of his pocket a thing of, of, of lighter fluid. And he squirts the lighter fluid into my turbo and lights a match. So now I'm sitting in my truck. My entire engine is on fire. I have a $450,000 truck be, or boat behind me, and my car is in flames. And all of a sudden, he comes up to the window, and he goes, now, 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 to start the friggin' motor. I fire the motor, and the biggest explosion I've ever heard happened, and everything shot out the tailpipe, and my truck started. Wow. This, this guy did it with a, <laughs> with a lighter fluid and a match. Fixed the entire rig. And it was literally one of the craziest, most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. He put my turbo back together, and I pulled off, and I went straight to the border. It was awesome. Thomas has a question for you. He is asking, he's saying, John, you have changed the path of a lot of people's lives. Do you hold that responsibility close to your heart? 100. Yes, I do. And, and it's actually, Thomas, it's, 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 it's why I'm here now. Um, yeah, it's why I'm here. Um, I've thought about taking my own life a couple of times in some dark times and, um, and that can get pretty heavy. And the thing that pulled me out was that I have the ability to change people's lives and, and, and to make them see a different path. And, um, that's not anything I've ever really admitted on press or anything before. And, yeah, it, it was pretty heavy. Back in the days when they kicked me out of the hospital, I was addicted to pain pills. They, they addicted me. I didn't addict myself. They addicted me. And uh, one time in the center of my jump ring, I had a shotgun in my mouth ready to do it. And, um, and it was heavy at uh, best. And the thing that stopped me was looking into my dog's eyes. I had two dogs, Elvis and Cash, and there were two, a chocolate lab and a yellow lab. And... If they weren't there, I probably would have blasted myself. And that was when I realized that I was here for a whole different purpose than to do what I was here to do. And that's when I, my, my entire path changed to changing people's lives. And, and I do that a lot by example. I don't, I don't do it so much as by saying, I, I try to lead by example and lead by example on Facebook. And, and like I said, I don't just tell the good. I'm not here saying, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And I, I mean, with what I just admitted, you can tell. But you have to tell the truth to get the real visceral answer. You have to tell the truth. And this is one of the battles that I had with Chantel about our, about our social media, was that she only wanted to, like, she didn't want to put anything on, on social media, and I told her that, that with us and with me, it's kind of, the, kind of the, the price you pay, because I sell tickets because my people get the truth, and if the truth is that I had a shotgun in my mouth, or the truth is that I didn't, it's the truth, and, and I, I have no embarrassment for what I've done, I have no, I have no shame, I have no, do I have regret? Sure. Um, do I have remorse? Sure. But you know what? I'm fucking human. It doesn't matter that I have my name all over the world. It, it, I still put my pants on one leg at a time. And, and so I'm just a human that just happens to have a name that's on the side of casinos and shirts and shit. And so, yeah, man, it, it's all about changing the path of people. And I do that through my, through my Facebook. Um, and I hope people that are out there that aren't on my Facebook, John Huntington, will look it up. And, and I post the truth. And some of my posts aren't too, aren't too great. And aren't you happy? My post this morning was was all about our what we're going through, and and um, I'm sure she's not too happy about that. But it's the truth, and and it is what it is. And so, you know, whatever. Hey, did you ever party with Sammy Hagar? Yeah. Do you know him well? The only reason why I ask that is because, you know, recently he came out in a Rolling Stone article that he is actually in contact with nine di ninth, what he calls ninth dimensional alien beings. Ninth dimensional? Ninth dimensional alien beings. What, is, what the hell is that? I have no idea. Some sort of superpower alien, man. 
That's he's been. Yeah, I, dude, I, fuck, I, I, yeah. See, Sammy, Sammy needs to take a pill. Just whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, man. Whatever, dude. Like whatever. Give me a break. Have you ever nice dimensional? Yeah. Come on, man. Have you? Ever... I, I think some people just say shit just to say shit to blow blow up the media, and that's what you just did, Dave. So come on, do better than that. Char is asking, have you ever looked into yourself with the way that you felt Bigfoot and spirits and things that hurt you that you may be an empath? Oh, my God. Who just said that? Char. Holy shit. Okay. Um, Char. Am I? Yeah. Okay. Chantel is a major empath and a major indigo child and it's something that's been in my life very newly for the last two and a half months since um her and i started being together and um it's um wow okay let me let me hold on let me um Give me a second here. Yeah, no problem. It is a heavy question. Um, I don't know. Okay, because this is it. I've never, I've never experienced an empath. I, I, I've never, I've never understood an empath. I didn't know, I didn't know there were empaths. Um, I, I, I didn't know what an empath was. Um, um it. it yeah, it's that that. Okay, Chantel is a major empath. Okay, and it's something that I dealt with over the last two and a half months, and it is the craziest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh yeah. Do do I think I'm an empath? I think that I have. I think that that I might be. I really do think I might be. I think that I don't know how to tap it as she does, and I think that I think that. The abilities of an empath are, are mind blowing, are beyond comprehension, and are um, as you can tell, I, I don't lose words much. And, and until you until you've been in my shoes and you've experienced a true empath in your presence, you truly don't know what it is. And 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 and, and it, it is such a thing that will take you so far beyond it's heavy okay okay let me get real with you it, okay i've had i've had sexual experiences with my with 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 my ex that that or with my uh, whatever she is with chantel that 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 in her mindful meditation and everything that she that are that are so far beyond anything that I've done with fucking five girls in my bus or orgies or that that are just like man I it is such I I can't even put it into words and I'm not a man that loses words it, it is that whole subject is crazy to me and I can tell you this right now that I I didn't know much about it until. Until it was spoken to me a couple of months ago, and I can tell you this: I'm gonna. Who, who's the caller? What's the name? Char Sharon. Actually. Uh, yeah, Sharon. I, I'm gonna start looking deeply into it. I'm going to start looking into whether or not I am that, because you're the second person that has asked me if I think I'm an empath. And and the, the funny thing is, that I've never even heard that term before Chantel said it to me. So. There's something out there that I don't really know what's going on, and I have a funny feeling now that Chantel is going to come back in my life to explain it. But I think that I don't know. It's an it's amazing feeling, right man. Now. Hey, John. It's a trip. John, I want to say thanks for being on Spaced Out Radio, bro, and telling your story. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, bro. I tell you what, I had a great time. This is probably one of the best interviews I've ever done. I've never really got this kind of time to really dig into to, to what I'm about and what's going down. And and Dave, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I thought it was four minute breaks with 26 minutes of music. The fact that I got to do shit, what three hours of talking and really telling people what I'm about and what I'm down with, and 
The truth is um, awesome to me. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My friend, you hold on. I'm going to wrap up this show right now, and then I'm going to chat with you right afterwards, give you a big thank you. want to say thank you, John, for being with us and explaining to our audience. You took us to a whole new level tonight. Appreciate that so much. Yeah, man. Aloha, guys. Everybody, please say hi to me on Facebook at John Huntington. You'll find me in Kona, Hawaii. Um, come by Bongo Benz, and um, don't forget to look up HawaiianHarleyTours.com. Uh, that will be coming soon, and come out and ride some choppers with me in Hawaii, all right? Aloha. Aloha. John Huntington, formerly of Hart and Huntington. Tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio, we're back in the paranormal. It is S.J. Wells, our guest, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. SpacedOutRadio.com is your site. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Thank you so much to everyone for listening in, and John much many blessings to you. You're an empath. Good night.